everyone watching online, we're going to hold for a couple extra minutes so we can make sure everyone uh, logs in before we get started. So we'll be starting in approximately five minutes. Thank you.
Test, test. Level good? Test, you on you on? Good morning, REDS members and people joining today. My name is Anthony Fernandez, past president of the Redwood Empire Dental Society. Uh, it's my honor today to introduce, introduce our speaker, Dr. Julie Kellogg. Dr. Julie Kellogg is a third generation general dentist practicing in Walla Walla, Washington. It's fun to say. She is a certified professional coach, writer, real estate investor, dog mom, skier, and shoe aficionado. She previously served as a hospital governing board member, uh, pre-dentistry course director, AADP program chair, and president of the Walla Walla Valley Dental Society. She is currently the editorial advisory board chair at the WSDA News. Julie also speaks on, and coaches on dental caries risk management, the subject of today's lecture, wellness coaching, the emotional journey of retirement for dentists, yay, <laughs> and being a dental spouse. She is the founder of Travel with Texture, a blog and coaching program for the quiet, driven professionals to find more freedom, creativity, and dimensional experiences. And also, uh, I'd like to mention that Julie is also a good friend of, uh, a common friend with mine, with Dr. Kim Kush, who's a leader in preventive dentistry, who was a mentor there. And uh, she's a graduate of Loma Linda University. So let's uh, give her a big reds welcome, Dr. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's such a such a pleasure to be here. I get to come from one wine town to another as Walla Walla is, is an up and coming wine region and it's just beautiful here. We've still been having a little wintry weather in Walla Walla so it's fun to come here and, and maybe have 80 degree weather today. Um, so today part of the course is sponsored by Carry Free um, and we have some goodies here for you which you can contact the Dental Society to get. I am a third generation dentist, as um, we mentioned, and I do host and found the Travel with Texture and 5G Coaching, a blog and, and coaching program. Um, for all of you attending today, Carry Free will provide a free webinar for your practice to introduce you to their products. There's samples and books here for you, and you can also receive free copies of Dr. Cooch's book, Why Me?, which is also great for patients. This is a rewrite of the book that's won some nonfiction awards, um, and it's a great resource to hand out to your patients. And so there's a box of books here um, for, the, for the Dental Society, and um, you can also order them um, using this QR code, which I think will also be uploaded to your website. So three generations is a lot of big shoes to fill, and uh, it comes with quite a genetic legacy. But I want you to go back with me and imagine as a young dental graduate, barely got her license, standing in the office, this was when we were still not switched over to digital x-rays, right? Standing at this light box, looking at this full mouth series of x-rays. And the dental assistant comes up to me and I said, somebody needs a root canal. Pause. She says, that's your dad. So here's the x-rays that you can see, some very large carious lesions. This is my dad, the perfectionist dentist, my hero, the guy who details his car, trims his dyes, does everything with the utmost care, flosses and brushes his teeth perfectly, and this is what's going on. My little baby dentist world was kind of rocked at that point. I'd barely even treated a patient in private practice. What, what's going on here? They didn't teach me this in dental school. So this started my journey with my dad. That's my dad with me there in front of our office, and um, this started my journey of down the road of how do we think about dental caries? Maybe drilling and filling really isn't the solution. And so I, I uh, went to dental school with Dr. Brian Novi. He's also a leader in the world of caries. If you haven't ever had a chance to hear him, go hear him. 
he used to work for Disney, and he completely puts on a show. You will learn so much. Um, and then Dr. Kim Cooch, who is the founder of Carry Free, has become a good friend and mentor of mine. And these are some really key people that, that started me on this journey of, of going down the world of how do we start to think differently about dental caries. So today, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about geeky dental carry science. And I gave this program in Texas a few months ago, and a young dentist looks at his older partner that he was in practice with, and he says, are we really going to talk about dental caries all day? Yes, in a sense we are, but we're going to make it a lot more fun. We're going to talk about it in some different ways. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about coaching, which completely changed how I practice and think about going into dentistry. So we're going to talk about a new shift called P4 Dentistry. We're going to look at caries risk management. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about the effects of pH. And we'll look at it in these different categories of diagnosis, intervention, therapeutics, behavior. And I have a little fun section about beverages having to do with sports drinks and how we can work with so much of what's going on with these, with these sports programs. So, we're going to keep it fast. You're going to get flooded with a lot of science, but hopefully at the end of the day, you'll say that geeky carry science was kind of fun. So today we're going to go upstream. And I don't know if any of you have read this book that came out in the last couple of years, but the premise is kind of this. You're sitting on the shore, kind of the little beach of a river with your friend, and all of a sudden you see a child out in the river that's flailing around and yelling for help. And you and your friends start to run to the river to try to save this child. All of a sudden, there's another one. And then there's another one. And you haven't even been able to fully get the first one rescued. And all of this is happening so fast. And, all, and you turn, and you look, and you see your friend going out of the river and starting to walk along the shoreline. And you say, hey, hey, we've got all these kids to, sh to save. What are we going to do? And your friend says, I'm going upstream to figure out who the hell is putting all these kids into the river. And so that's what we want to try to do with caries today is to say, how do we look at this instead of each patient and say, here's these cavities you have. We have to drill and fill. We have to do all this. How do we go upstream and start to look at this a little bit differently? This lady comes into the office and she says, my crown's broke. I just want to get my crowns fixed. We have teeth and we have cavities. But if we just go in there and try to fix our crowns, have we changed anything? We have to start to go upstream to start to think about caries as a disease and how it, this is a whole person thing. This is not just the teeth. It's just not some surfaces that got demineralized. This is a whole person, and this is a disease. And so today, I hope you'll take this journey upstream with me. So Leroy Hood is a physician. He's a founder of a high-tech company in Seattle. And he has coined this term P4 medicine, but really starting to say, we have technology now. We have changes. We can look at things at the molecular, the cellular level. And we can take each individual's unique health experience and do something specific about it. Instead of just throwing medications and throwing protocols at symptoms, Let's start a looking at disease from this unique whole person point of view. And even the ADA is starting to, to come along and, and the leadership in professional dentistry to say, we've got to start looking at cavities differently, right? It's not the single tooth. It's not the single surface. This is a whole person disease. We have to start doing dentistry as much as we pride ourselves in being precise, right? We have to start looking at this as, at a new precision level. Untreated caries is still the most prevalent disease or presence um, worldwide. You know, I mean, in everybody, we're, we're, uh, we're continuing to see this being the most prevalent. And when you look over the last 24 years in systemic reviews, it's not changed. We're doing a lot of drilling and filling. We're doing a lot of hygiene. And yet, our outcomes are really just kind of going along and staying the same. And so th there's not been a lot of new, but this is something that just came out from the ADA in 2022, again confirming that we've had no change in the prevalence. 
meaning yes, we know that carries is higher in the low socioeconomic groups. We know that there's differences in certain racial groups or ethnic groups. We know that you know people who have a little bit more resources tend to go to the dental office a little bit more. But in each one of those groups, our prevalence isn't changing. We're not, we're not shifting that curve at all. This is a really fascinating study done in a town of New Zealand. So this is their most recent update. This town has started out with just a little over about 1,000 people, and they're trying to follow their oral health from birth until death. And so now we've just hit the point that this, this population is around that 45 age group. So this is their most recent one. And they took the people that had had kind of the poorest oral hygiene and the highest amount of caries in their first 30 years. And now we're looking at what's happening from that 32 to 45. And it just continued to be the same. If there was a high carry incidence when they were young, poor oral hygiene, it just continues to see that they're more, more carry incidents as they, as they continue through midlife, they continue to have um, poor oral hygiene. So what's our most modern definition of dental caries? It is a biofilm mediated, diet modulated, multifactorial, non-communicable, transmissible, but non-communicable dynamic disease resulting in the net mineral loss from dental hard tissues. And so this is all the very new 2020 definition that's being adopted. I love the little graphic here, just remembering biofilm mediated, diet modulated. Those are two really huge, huge keys. So Dr. Philip Marsh, um, longtime researcher, uh, really pioneered the idea of this sort of ecological microflora and biofilm. And he was the one that really started to identify that pH from carbohydrate availability and metabolism um, is what's a huge driver in dental caries. So why is pH important, right? We know that homeostasis throughout the body, staying to this area of neutrality is a healthier place. It, we know the acid balance, acid alkaline balance that we were taught in chemistry class. Saliva is there to buffer, it's there to try to keep the balance. Our diet and our biofilm are oftentimes the things that are shifting around that it has to adjust to to maintain that neutrality. So let's go back to this ideas of these graphs that we all saw in our dental and dental hygiene school textbook, the Stefan curve. And so we have this critical line of pH, right? We know at 5.5 is where enamel will start to demineralize. And so every time we eat or drink something that's not water, we have this little dip below the critical pH line. And we have a nice little curve that comes up. A normal healthy saliva will take about 30 minutes to bring things back up above that critical pH line. So when we're snacking, what happens? We're spending more time below that line. Sometimes we snack and our saliva is trying, trying, trying to come about the line about the time it's about to get there. Oh, let's have another snack. Let's go for it again. And we, and we lose that time below that, that critical pH. What happens when we have a dry mouth? In my practice, we see a ton of retirement age patients. So we actually get excited when we finally see a patient that has saliva because we see so many patients that have, that have dry mouth. So what happens when we have hyposalivation? That curve of the saliva to try to bring that up extends a long time, right? In some of the extreme cases, you wonder if you're even getting there because they're so dry. But that curve extends a long time. So what happens if you combine the two? We mostly spend the whole day underneath that critical, critical line. We also know that sometimes a lot of those dry mouth patients, they like to snack and sip on things, right? Because it's trying to relieve that uncomfortable, bad taste feeling in there. This is a battle that's hard to win, right? If we're trying to keep those, those mineralization um, healthy and, and um, under that. So I think this is a great site. I'm happy to share slides with you or whatever, but we've just been talking about it with our hygiene team that we're going to put some of these slides on every computer so we can pop them up in the, this because it's just a great visualization um, for our patients. 
So what do we know about the current biofilm, right? We, we talk about biofilms all the time now in terms of gut, right? This has become very popular. You scroll through your Apple News, right? There's always something about, about gut health. We know that there's a lot of things that are causing this gut dysbiosis. But what about this biofilm dysbiosis in our mouth? And what are the systemic and hereditary effects of this? There's a lot of things that interact with, with the biofilm. So I do a couple crazy things. I'm a big skier and I like to paddle board in the summer. And so I, I tend to switch them up in their seasons. This is <laughs> actually in Northern Idaho on Christmas day a couple years ago. Uh, I, I was determined to prove that I could paddle board on, on Christmas day. Uh, so what do we know about the microbiome? I don't think there was much microbiome growing in the lake that day. Ann Tanner out of the Forsyth Institute um, at Harvard has done a lot of research on a lot of the, the um, pathogens that we have studied. Um, and she identified Scardovia wigsii as, as particularly prevalent and associated with early childhood caries. Um, and interestingly, it's one of those friends that likes to come to the party with strep mutans, but it can also be present on its own. So it's both. It, it, it uh, um, can act in a lot of things. It loves acid just like strep mutans. It loves to live in those acid environments. Um, and, and a big player in this, this um, biofilm shift in caries. There's also Slachia exigua. Um, which is a bit another big player that likes to come to the party in early childhood caries. Um, and we know that there's probably 60 to 100 or more ones that we haven't even named or haven't even figured out how to culture yet. So there's a lot of players. This is a big shift in some of the last few years in research is that we're seeing candida is a big player. And we always think about this, the people that have been on antibiotics, right, or that don't clean their dentures well. They come in with all the thrush in their mouth. But we're seeing at least three species of candida, especially the Dubliniensis, is a big player in caries. And that, this study was done in preschool children. Um, and this is a new paper that was just out in 2022, talking about albicans and Dubliniensis, in which they are proposing that these are keystone pathogens in dental caries. And I brought the, the um, description of this, and they're saying in, their, in this study, the models show that the presence of specific species of candida in dental plaque may be a better descriptor of severe early childhood caries than the mentioned behavioral factors. So we all know that a lot of the behavioral risk things that we look at kids, but how do we start thinking about candida as this, as this player? We have a lot to learn still with this, but I think this is a big deal that just this last year that they're identifying this as a keystone pathogen. Um, we know that to strep mutans, we all learned about strep mutans, right, in our, in our education. It was, the big, it was the big evil bug. When my dad was in dental school over 50 years ago, they told his class that they would probably be out of a job within a decade because we were going to have a vaccine for cavities. Well, he retired a couple of years ago, 50 years later, and uh, let's just say his practice was plenty busy. <laughs> so this is a really fascinating study that was done in Scandinavia where they have a fairly low caries incident, but they have noted that when there is a lot of caries, strep mutans is oftentimes not even present. So they studied adolescents and they, they went through and found that there's these four clusters. And Scardovia wigsii is sometimes with strep mutans, oftentimes, because these are the ones that like to invite people to the party, and sometimes it's not. And then in some of these, these groups that had cavities without strep mutants, there was this grouping of bacteria that were just a little less lactic acid producing than some of the others. So just some very interesting things that lead us to say this whole idea of biofilms and how it relates to caries is a lot more complex than we used to think. So this idea that we just had strep mutans or we have this or that, we've talked about biofilms in perio, right? So the shift of can we start to identify different behaviors of biofilms? Is it a healthy biofilm? 
If we go back to pH, you have some pH, you can have some healthy plaque on the teeth. Um, is it a karyogenic biofilm? Or is it a periodontic pathogenic biofilm? We know that there's several of that. So the idea that there's one pathogen for every one disease is a shift that we're really having to make in healthcare and in dentistry. That we have to look at what's going on in the m microbial community and by who's come to this microbial party is going to decide what kind of behaviors are things and how we might want to treat this patient. So every individual is different. Every biofilm is going to be a little bit different. And so to start to picking up some of these things, starting to understand that every one of our patients is a whole person and is very, very unique. So what about this systemic effect? So I told you I like to screw up my sports in different seasons, right? This was on July 29 last year, up on Mount Hood on the glacier. Amazingly, there's kids from all over the world that come to train ski tr racing. 6.30 in the morning, there's like 120 little 10-year-olds going to the chairlift early in the morning. But it's a beautiful thing. It's cool to be up on these volcanoes. Mount Hood is a dormant volcano. So I like to say, we have these systemic effects, right? But we know even under dormant volcanoes, there's stuff burbling, right? So what's going on at this systemic level that sometimes we don't, we don't realize? This, it, this just blew my mind when I saw this study. Most of these patients were edentulous, right? You would think we get rid of the teeth, we get rid of the karyogenic pathogens, right? They don't have this. Okay, edentulous patients had strep mutans. And when they took arthrosclerotic plaques out of their blood vessels, strep mutans was in every one of them. That's huge implications for our oral systemic health. It's just, it's just sort of hard to even wrap your mind around that. But I think that is just extremely profound that even on those patients that are edentulous, we have to be thinking about this at a systemic level. Heart valves, almost just as bad. When we take samples out of heart valves, almost 90% of the time, strep mutans. With several others. But even P. gingivalis, right? We think about this in our perio, nasty bug, right? It's only there 4.2% of the time. And in brain lesions, when you have aneurysms and infarcts and hemorrhages in the brain, they're finding specific different types of strep mutants, even in some of these brain events. So we know that strep mutants is, is just, it's there. It likes to have all its sticky little polysaccharides just that makes that sticky plaque on your teeth. It goes all through the bloodstream and it likes to stick and it likes to invite its nasty friends to the party. So what about genetics? <laughs> this, is, this is Mochi. She is now my 15-year-old little old lady girl. Um, she has some special genetics, as you can tell if you look closely at her teeth. If I pulled up her upper lip, her class 3 underbite is probably close to a centimeter and a half. It's huge for a little dog. But I always like to talk about genetics with her. She's such a sweet little lady. So we have one of the... Um, Big known factors in genetic dental care is beta defensive one. Um, it, it is a bacteriolytic enzyme that comes up through our saliva. Another huge thing, if you have the TT genotype, you have seven times higher risk of dental caries than if you have the CC genotype. That's huge. This is just part of our immune system, right? Our, all these different enzymes and proteins and cells that that are involved in our immune function are very different and unique between all of us. Seven times, just with beta defensive one. What about our taste genes? We have Taser 38 and we have Taser R2, one for bitter, one for sweet. Um, I'm sure many of you who have children or have seen children in your practice, um, you know those ones that hate the green vegetables. Maybe you were one of them as a kid, right? Anything green was just like, no, thank you. It was horrific. It drove your parents crazy. Um, these are super tasters. So what's going on with the expression of our taste genes will hugely affect our caries risk, both in a protective or in a, in a promotive sort of way. Um, so some of these kids that have this uh, bitter, bitter taste gene that is expressed, it typically 
tends to express less after about the age of 35. A kid, steamed beet greens or something, and I just hated them. And she was like, you have to eat two bites as a kid. I would douse them in ketchup and try to swallow it whole because I thought it tasted so disgusting. Now things are much more tolerable to me. But I think it's fascinating to look at this in terms of how, how does taste, taste affect this. And one of the studies that I haven't found a great study to look at, but I, I really am interested in as I work with my retirement population, is as we get to that older age, as we get to drier mouth, how are those e expressed differently? So we even see different populations sort of in the nursing homes where some of them are, they really like the sweets and they, or they really like the savory. How are that gonna affect those people in terms of their, of their caries risk? And this is a super special one. This one is Lysel II. So a number of years ago when this came out, um, Dr. Cooch um, had just read the paper and goes to his office a few days later and somebody had sent him a young patient and the, the, the dentist said to the mom, I have no idea why your kid is only getting cavities on the lower front teeth. But I bet you Dr. Cooch will know. And so they go to see Dr. Cooch and he had just read this research that came out. And he says, oh, you have the Lysel 2 gene. And they're like, what? Where did you come up with that? But it's literally like a lysozyme. It's kind of a bacteriolytic enzyme. It comes up through the, the submandibular glands and certain modifications of it mean that you will only get cavities on your lower front teeth. He, Dr. Cooch, has, in his years of practicing, has only seen, I think, about two or three of these patients. I have never identified one in my practice yet, but if you happen to see one, you will look like the smartest person in the state. So now you know. Um, so we have 47 different gene loci now that, that we have been identified to have to do with this. There's probably a ton more. They like to interact with each other as well as with the environment. So this gets really complex, but we can have enamel formation, immune response, taste genes, saliva genes, all kinds of other ones that we're not even sure. Carbonic anhydrase um, that works with pH. Um, this QR code is to a article that I just recently published on um, the Ignite DDS blog that talks about some of this genetic stuff. And if you're interested in sharing it with your team or or family members. Um, so again, we have this idea that the genes and the environment and the lifestyle and all these things kind of come together and where all this mixes is sort of the degree of a disease manifestation that we will have. And so if you look at plaque, lactobacilli, age, saliva buffering capacity, as well as beta defensive one, taser 38, carbonic anhydrase six, that all can oftentimes, in the interactions of those, explain up to 80% of our DMFT scores. Pretty profound, pretty complex. We're not always gonna explain it. We're gonna look at it into how we can break this down simpler for you, but I think these are really fascinating science things to know so that we really start to understand what is the knowledge that we have at this specific molecular and genetic level. So today we're gonna to spend a lot of time talking about this idea of what we talk about P4 dentistry. So taking P4 medicine, wrapping it into P4 dentistry, and how we turn this into using caries risk management easily and effectively in our practice. So the idea of P4 dentistry is on four Ps. We're gonna talk about it as being predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory. So this really looks at it as each person being a unique person, gathering the scientific data that we have. Can we make it predictive? Can we make it preventive? It has to be personalized. We're all unique. We all want to be treated as unique individuals. And it's going to be so much more effective if it's participatory. And so this is how the premise of what we call caries risk management is built on. So where did we start with all this? Dr. Fernandez, you probably remember some of this because you've been involved in camera, but remember some of these early caries risk flow assessment forms? Yeah. Okay, if you take Delta Dental the way I do in my practice, you do not have time to do that. It's too complicated, right? The patient doesn't even understand what you're asking or why you're doing all this, right? So then we take the whole thing and we go, okay, let's make all this list of guidelines and all these different things you can do and follow and blah, 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 blah. 
Okay, can you keep track of all that? I don't even want to read that this early in the morning. And then we created a letter that had 19 points of things that patients should do and change at home. Okay, do our patients even floss? No, do you know how much floss the average patient uses in a year? 18 inches. <laughs> Think about that. Do you think they're really stretching it out and cleaning it every time and hanging it on the little hook? No, it's the 18 inches they got out right before they came to see you, right? This is just not practical, right? Oh, and then we have the occlusal protocol for ICDOS, right? Of going, okay, we've got six different ones. The certain ones we can do nothing, certain ones we can remineralize, certain ones we can do. It's overly complicated, right? It's just too complicated. We don't have time to do this. This is what we created to try to do caries risk assessments and caries risk management. You guys are all from California. You know what this is, right? We don't have them quite this complicated in Walla Walla, but we need this. We need to go predictably, recognizably from point A to point B quickly. And that's really what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about a lot of science that, that um, supports this, but this is what we wanna keep coming back to. How do we do this in a preventive and predictable way? And so we humans, we like pattern recognition, right? There's all this noise around in our world, but we're always trying to look for the patterns. So we've got the usual suspects. Saliva, 63% of the time, saliva is going to be involved at a population level in dental caries. We have diet, 55% of the time, diet's going to be involved. 50% of the time, biofilm is going to be a big player. At a population level, genetics is about a 90% component. We'll start to learn more and more about that as the years come by, but this is kind of what they're, they're talking about. And it always comes back to pH. 100% of the time, pH is going to be one of our players. So we really want to start to identify what are these patterns that we can, can do. So we, we know that we have dental caries, right? We have the dead body. So we have to play Columbo and say, who done it? And this is where a caries risk assessment form becomes very useful. So here is a very simple form. You and your patient are going to do it together, so the patient is very proactive. It's quick and easy. You can do it in under a minute. It's all color coordinated. There, there are copies for you and links to the website. And we have codes so that you can put this into your treatment software and you can keep track of where these caries risk assessments are. So if we have no risk factors, no disease indicators, D0601, patient is low risk. If we have even one risk factor, we're going to go to the moderate risk category, D0602. And if we have at least one disease indicator, we're going to be in the high risk category, D0603. Super simple, super fast. You can figure out predictably who did it. So let's start to look at these patterns that you're going to see quickly on the caries risk assessment. Saliva, what do you see in this picture? Looks pretty dry, right? Those gums are pretty shiny. You don't see any wet saliva bubbles, any of that. What typically causes dry mouth in our patients? 70% of Americans are taking at least one prescription medication. We wrote 6.3 billion, with a B, prescriptions. Big business, almost $400 billion. 20% are taking five or more. We know how that adds up. How do you even keep track of it, right? They bring the bag or the big long copied list to your office of the medications. And with flow rate of saliva, if it's less than 3.5 milliliters per minute, we know that we're gonna have a much higher risk of dental caries and periodontal complications in the mouth. Those tests to measure the flow are not really fun to do, but it's just a nice benchmark to know. So very quickly, what are you going to start to look for when it comes to saliva? What does it look like in the mouth? How dry does it look? And what are the medications that they're, what they're taking? So diet. 
What do you see in this picture? Caries all over, right? We know that when there's caries all over, you should be thinking sugar. <laughs> Americans eat 22.7 teaspoons of sugar a day. Okay, so I brought a little visual because 22 teaspoons doesn't think that much, right? You think of the little teaspoon thing that you have in your kitchen, it's not that much. This is 23 teaspoons of sugar. Every day, the average American is eating this much free sugars. And just feel that, right? Let feel that. That's pretty heavy. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, let me put some in my coffee here. <laughs> this is what the recommended amount is, less than a teaspoon a day. And this is different. So I mean, just feel this. I mean, I've, I'm sorry for those of you virtually that you don't get to feel it. You should have come in person. Um, but, but it's impressive, right? And 51 pounds of high fructose corn syrup a year. Brian Novi talks about that corn sugar, like dextrose, our parotid glands take it up and keep resecreting it out over the saliva over time. I mean, corn syrup is just the nasty one, but this is our big thing that we have to fight, and we'll talk more about that, that later. 25% of the global disease burden is linked to free sugars. This is the expensive elephant in the room, right? So we see caries widespread through the mouth. We want to think diet and sugar. OK, so what about biofilm? What are we going to start to look about for biofilm? That patient that comes in, and you just want to ask, do you even own a toothbrush? Over 60 microbes have been identified as potential pathogens. We know candida is now the big player that we have to start to be aware of. And we know that high frequency of streptococcus mutants and lactobacillus and low toothbrushing combined with maybe that daily pop soda drink increases to at least a 50% higher amount of dental caries. So when you see plaque in the mouth or you see a high carry screen, which we'll talk about later, definitely be thinking about biofilm as one of your usual suspects. And so what are some other things? You know, we can, we can link some other things, you know, such as um, acid reflux as being a player or some of these things. This is a really interesting graph and article that, that Brian Novi was a part of, of really looking at our general health and wellness and saying, what are these factors that figure into this kind of sort of whole person health and wellness? Um, genetics is a big one at the whole person level, right? We have a lot of things going on with our genetics. We know that. Behavior is at 40%. Those of us as healthcare providers, as much as we take ourselves seriously, we're really only 10% a factor in people's overall wellness. But we have a huge effect on their behavior. And so that's what we're going to really talk about some today with our wellness coaching is, is that this is this place that we have a huge effect. So at the end of the day, you go through all your usual suspects, right? It always comes back to Kaiser Sose. It's always pH is involved in this, right? <laughs> but the thing that I want to take you to take home, and we're going to keep coming back this today, is what are the three things you want to look at clinically? Saliva, diet, biofilm. It always comes back to pH. All of these things lead to pH. So uh, we talked about being a dog mom. This is my newest rescue. This is Jojo. Um, he has a periscope ear and a floppy ear. So he is doing his assessment over the lake here. So we're going to talk about Carrie's risk assessment. We're going to talk about some diagnosis. And then what do we prescribe? What do we, what do we start to think about to do for the patient? So for a while here today, we're going to really jump into a lot of science around some of this stuff. We're going to hit you pretty hard. I promise it will get lighter and more fun later in the day. So we're going we're gonna to do this caries risk assessment in the practice. We're going to be involved. The, the top part of it, the patient's going to do. So oftentimes you can have the patient do it in the, in the reception room while they're waiting for their, for their appointment. Um, that makes it participatory, part of this, this P4 dentistry. I think you will find that it opens a lot of conversations, which we're going to work with this afternoon as we get into some of the coaching language and how to do this. 
and, and just really being on that one-on-one -on -one level with the patient. And typically going to try to do it every year um, so that we keep a good baseline of what's going on with that, with that patient. We'll talk about a couple examples of that. But we know from John Featherstone, who's sort of what one of the godfathers of Carrie's research, right, <laughs> um, is that taking a baseline Carrie's risk assessment really predicts the future, right? We want it to be preventive and predictive. And so this carries risk assessment is really going to help us identify that. And again, Featherstone's research talks about that if we're doing some intervention in an anti-caries way, every 18 months we will at least prevent one new cavity in every one in three people. That doesn't sound like much, right? That's kind of complicated statistics. But when you think about that we really haven't moved the needle with our typical drill and fill dentistry, we can start to slowly move the needle this way. It's, it's hard to measure prevention. You know, I talk about, and we're, we're working with our retired patients so much and their, and their dry mouth and, and always trying to tweak little things and what's changing in their life. And, and sometimes they'll say, well, I've been doing everything you said to do, doc, and I still have two new cavities. We know how fragile those root surfaces are. And I say, yeah, but if we hadn't been doing all that, you might have had 10, right? Because we've seen those patients too. So prevention can be really hard to measure, but it is, uh, it is an, an important thing. So we've had all these different caries risk assessments forms, right? A number of organizations and schools have put out different caries risk assessments forms. It's really hard to compare which one is best, which one is it should use. I love the one that's the simplest and gets us really good outcomes. But the bottom line is when they com they compared them all, they brought them all together, they pooled all the data, 60% of our patients were high risk. That's a lot. We have, we have space for, for change and intervention and growth. Okay, any questions so far? Are we sort of trending to some interesting things here? Mm -hmm. what if, are those adventurous patients with dentures? Uh, my, problem, my, my clients all go to primary care. They have two dentures. All together, yeah. So do you, do, is, is that statistic based on edentulous patients with dentures, which we know can get really nasty and coated and not that pretty? Right. So that study, I believe, was done in Japan. So the question is for the, for the virtual audience is, did these edentulous patients who had strep mutans in their atherosclerotic plaque, did they have dentures or were they purely edentulous? And I don't remember if they specified in the study dentures. I know that there were a few patients in the study who had some limited dentition, but there was a majority of patients that were edentulous. I don't remember that they identified in that, in that study. So I can't answer that specifically. I can go back and try to pull some data for you if you want, but no, no. I don't, I, I, I'm not. I'm not sure. I just, um, I think the point is to saying the strep mutans recruits people to the party. It throws the party everywhere. Just pulling teeth doesn't solve the problem at an oral systemic level. I think it's a great question because you're, you're right. Some of those dentures are pretty gross. <laughs> Any other questions? Is this kind of making some sense so far? Those of you who are in the virtual world, please send your questions. We'll try to, we'll try to answer them. I don't know anything real recent. So you probably know as much as I do. And the question is, is do we have, um, and we have recent data about how much of our dentist professional population is using carries risk assessments and, and, and reporting it to the insurance. Yeah. The, the, the biggest dental insurance company, which I shall not name, they told me in person that it was the single biggest. Yeah. And I would believe that. I would believe that, right? Because even if we know a lot of this information, how often are we having the conversations with our patients, right? We've been talking about this too, that we get so busy, and especially in this post-COVID world of we're busy, we're trying to get everybody in, right? We know a lot of this. We're identifying a lot of the usual suspects automatically, right? But are we formalizing this in a way where we're really having 
and empowering an effective conversation with the patient and reporting it to the insurance, which can really affect what their benefits are, right? Yeah. So I think, I think that's a really valid question, and I think we have a lot of room to improve on, on that. Okay, everybody good here? We're we ready to keep, keep rolling? Okay, so let's move into this world of diagnosis. What are the tools that we have to do some diagnosis, right? We have our visual exam. We get a lot of data visually with just looking in the patient's mouth. We have our radiographs. What are the usefulness? What do, what do we all get from our, our radiographs? And we have some biometric tests that we, can, that we can use. So what are some of these biometric tests? We have DNA-based tests, and we have the carry screen, which is an ATP bioluminescence test. Those are the two main biometric tests that we have. Um, Many of you may have used oral DNA on more of the perio side or looking at some virus sides in some of your prevention programs. But what do you see is the biggest barrier here? Cost and time, right? Cost and time. So this is a genetic test that oral DNA runs, and it looks at three species. So it looks at um, strep mutans, strep sobrinus, and lactobacillus. Um, but we just talked about candida, right? So I thought, huh, all these new things have been coming out. So I looked up on the, on the oral DNA website, and they do have a candida test, but it does not test for candida dubliniensis, which is the, one of the big players in dental caries. Again, I didn't even look at what the cost was, but you, again, you have a time. It's not specific to caries. So it's on my to-do list to send them a bunch of papers and see <laughs> if we can start to shift that. Um, we have the carry screen test, which um, looks at the total biofilm load. It correlates to streptomatkins mutans specifically, and it, try it will also correlate to white spot lesions, interproximal lesions, and salivary flow. So how does that work? When we have these bacteria that love to live in the acidic environment, when they get into this acidic environment, they start to upregulate all these proteins to, so that they can do different actions to, to live in this acidic environment. One of them is, is they have to protect what the pH of is in their own cell, right? So they do this by using a lot of energy to pump hydrogen ions out through the cell membrane. And sometimes they're using up to 100 times more ATP. So this energy molecule ATP will be at 100 times level when we do that. So if we can take a swab and we swab this plaque, we can put it in a luciferin luciferase reagent. And that ATP, all that 100 times energy that's in this plaque, will bioluminesce. And so we can measure that light and correlate it to the total biofilm load. It is not diagnostic. This is not telling you whether or not the patient has caries but it's gonna give you a really good indication if we have a biofilm, a plaque, that is gonna be a friendly thing towards dental caries. So there's a strong correlation to the total oral bacteria to that of streptococci, including the cariogenic. It's this ATP driven, it's an indirect, right? It's not diagnostic, it's just a tool. And it was associated, like we talked about, with salivary flow, with high plaque, with these proximal and active white spot lesions. And it's very specific. So we have GC America has the saliva check. There's the carries wrist check where you have the little dish and you, you culture it out over, over time. Those are both very specific. Saliva check mutans, not so much. But what I love about the carry screen, you can do it in under 30 seconds. You get a reading. It's really easy for the patients to understand. It's very specific data. So the ADA has not updated their guidelines since 2006. So these still hold, and it correlates to kind of that color that we have on that carries risk assessment form, meaning if you don't have any risk factors and no active lesions, you're low risk. If you've had one or less lesions as an adult in the year and you have at least one risk factor, you're going to be moderate risk. And if you've had any lesion, you have multiple risk factors, you have suboptimal fluoride or dry mouth, you are going to be in that high risk category. And this QR code will take you 
to that set of guidelines if you want to have the official official set of guidelines. But these still hold true even though they have not been updated super recently. Again, we have this simple carries risk assessment form that I recommend doing every year to give you that baseline. Color coded, no risks, low risk, one risk factor, moderate risk, at least one disease factor, high risk. So what are we going to do, right? What do you do when your patient's going to Walmart and buying all this stuff? How do you sort through all this, this stuff that's on the shelf? Um, what are we going to do as, as, a, as a reparative strategy? What are some of the things that we have? We can remineralization, right, with fluoride or with nanohydroxyapatite, which we'll talk about a lot of the science with that. We have sealants. Sealants have been tried and true for quite a long time. We have ART, or what they call atraumatic restorative lesions. And if you haven't turned that term a lot, because it's not quite as common in some of our literature, this is essentially where you scoop out the soft stuff and you put some glass ionomer in there. And then we have our traditional drill and fill dentistry. So this is a post-orthodontic study that looked at the white spot lesions and determined that fluoride varnish was the only therapy that would start to remineralize those post-orthodontic white spot lesions. The control group was just your typical toothpaste, typical fluoridated toothpaste. And so under this, when you look at the pH and all these different gels that they looked at, they looked at all these different fluoride gels, including um, so silver diamine fluoride. Um, highly fluoridated um, denifris was the one that significantly reduced the caries progression and resulted in remineralization. Okay, so this is, this is because I come from a wine town. I actually brought Walla Walla wine again. Sorry, guys, that you didn't come in person. But <laughs> so, so this is where we're going to uh, give away a bottle of wine. And so I want somebody to tell me about their oral hygiene routine at home. Okay. You're not gonna believe this, but right before I walked out the door, do you know what I rinsed with? My new dental with my new tire for the black eye. Oh, I love that. Yeah. He, my, my dentist told me one of the carries, carry free rinse. Uh-huh. And I use it all the time. And when I miss, I rinse it with this. So what I do, I brush, I water pick, Okay. And I and I have floss when I floss because I it's like I leave a forensic trail of floss dirt that I brush. Okay, so you're brushing, water picking, and using the carry for rinse. I'm, I'm making sure that the, the virtual audience can hear us here. Yes, yes. And she has floss picks in her pocket. Yes. Okay. Um, so do you use your carry free rinse before or after you brush? Okay. And then I use her after I go to bed. Okay. And I notice I don't have any, you know, you don't have morning mouth when you use this stuff. Mm -hmm. So I just leave it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we got, we got the new marketing person for Carry Free here. <laughs> okay, so I have another question for you. Um, how much toothpaste do you use on your toothbrush? Maybe a pea sized amount. Okay, so we hear that in dentistry a lot, right? A pea sized amount of, of yeah. toothpaste on our toothbrush. Do you tend to slurp water with your toothbrush when you're done or get a drink of water when you're done brushing your teeth? When I use Colgate, yes. <laughs> I use some of these prescription ones, the prescription paste. Uh -huh. I'm not going to tell anybody about it. Uh -huh. I won't rinse it out because I know that's not what you're supposed to do. You want it to stay in there. Yeah. Be effective. So yeah. It's Colgate, yeah, I use Colgate. All right. Okay. Thank you for playing the game. So she's using a pea-sized amount of toothpaste and She's rinsing if you're not using sort of a prescription strength high fluoride Correct. toothpaste. Okay. This is a study that I just got super, super geeked out about because we think we've just done, we're so good as dental professionals, right? And I realized we might be doing it all wrong. And, <laughs> and I still struggle to do this all correctly. So in this study, they used little paper points to bring out fluid from the interproximal areas of your teeth and measure the retained fluoride interproximally between your teeth, right? This is where we have our high caries risk, right? So often interproximally between the teeth, right? So the amount of toothpaste, the duration that we brushed, 
And the amount of water that we rinse with has a profound effect. So if you use two centimeters of toothpaste versus one centimeter, so let's say one centimeter is that pea size that you talk about, right? We use that a lot. But what is the length of your average brush head, right? Okay, not your spinny Oral-B one, that one doesn't count. But your average manual toothbrush, right? It's pretty close to two centimeters. Hmm, that's kind of interesting. And how many of us are guilty, you probably don't even think about it, that you brush, you do your two minutes, we're probably good with that, right? And then we take it and we go start slurping water, or we grab that cup of water and we swim. I still have a hard time after all of this, right? Okay, but if you avoid drinking water and you use two centimeters of the toothpaste, you retain 50% more of that fluoride in approximately in time after you brush. Isn't that fascinating? Okay, I'm the geeky dentist. I get excited about this. So can I just share some Sarah's story? Sure, sure, sure. Come uh, here, but use, use the mic because so everybody can hear you on that. Hello, Reds members. Okay, so my hygienist, Christina, who's here, and we, we live and breathe this stuff every day. And that one of the take-homes we give our patients is what you're talking about. It's the concept of not rinsing your mouth out while you've just applied your, your fluoride dentrifice for maximum remineralization. So I'm so geeky. I go to these conferences, and there was a Nick Nara conference a couple years back it, locally. And there was a panel of experts up there who the, were the men and women who were the chemists that worked for GlaxoSmithKline, which is Sensodyne, and Colgate was there, and Procter & Gamble. So they literally had a table of men and women who were the chemists, and I got up on the mic, and I'd, I'd already been playing with the concept of, of advising our patients not to – after you brush your teeth, spit it all out. Don't eat your toothpaste. But after you're done brushing, just let that slurry of saliva and toothpaste hang in there and help remineralize. So I asked this panel of experts, you know, we're telling our patients, you know, after you brush your teeth, that make that the last step. Don't use Listerine or mouthwash or water or anything. Just brush your teeth, spit it all out, and then and go on. You know, let, let your mouth remineralize. So I asked the panel of experts, what, what do you think about this advice? So they're all out there talking back and forth. And the person on the microphone tells me they all talk to each other. They said, that's exactly how we all do it that way. That's how toothpaste was meant to be used. So we pass it on. My hygienist, we repeat uh -huh. that. And we have really good results with that. And I'll, I could talk about that later. Yeah. But, so just tell your yep. patients, think of your toothpaste like sunblock. Mm -hmm. You don't wash your face after. And my patients, as soon as we tell them, oh, it's like sunblock. I don't wash my face after I put my sunblock. If toothpaste is the last step or fluoride, whatever your rinses are. That's your last step. Don't interfere with it. Let your saliva deliver the minerals and the fluoride is helping with that remineralization. So even if you just do that one thing for your patients, you'll help move the needle. Yeah, I love that analogy. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's awesome. So I'm a Gen Xer. I haven't got into all this TikTok stuff, but I decided because I got so excited about this study <laughs> to make a little video. In the study, they talk about 10 milliliters or less of water, if you need to get a little something to use. 10 milliliters or less of water. Okay, so what are you going to do differently now? Rinse, you rinse before. And after. You rinse before, because you want to buffer before. So using, like what you're using, which is a high pH alkaline mouth rinse and a carry-free, you want to buffer, because if you've been having sugary snacks or acidic foods or stuff like that, 
your teeth are a little bit acid etched from that. You don't want to scrub that. You'll actually start taking away some of your enamel. So, so I know that nice feeling that we all habitually want to rinse with something afterwards, right? But, but it's actually much more effective if you buffer before you do, before you do the, the plaque removal. So, do you? I know, but we all have been, right? We're in this together, and I still sometimes just want to grab that big cup of water after so I that drink do. Of water you took at the end, right, that little. It was to demonstrate, yeah. It, it was just that. It was just to demostrate that they said in the study, ten milliliters or less mm -hmm. was was. So do, what you, do you do you do a thirty second or thirty three minutes at the very end? You can. You certainly could. It's a, yeah. You certainly could. But if you're brushing with say like the Pro Five Thousand, right? you've gotten a lot of that remineralizing stuff in there and you really want to let those bubbles because what they're talking about, that's where it really sits in those interproximal areas because you're using that gel and that foamy stuff. Brian Novi says, leave the foam alone. <laughs> <laughs> so. I can change it up easier in the evening when it's just a little better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and I, either, you know, either way, use another little bit of rinse. It's, it's yeah. certainly, certainly not gonna hurt. Um, okay, thank you for participating. Do you want white, red, or rosé wine? I'm not a rosé. Oh, I love it. It's my favorite. This is so exciting. So this is a little local incubator startup winery in Walla Walla. She is Chinese-American, woman-only winemaker, doing it. Her labels are just adorable, and she does one for every season. And so this is the spring, because we are in spring, so this is Rosé of San Giovese. Mm. And that one always sells out, so you have something quite, quite fun and exclusive. Thank yeah, thank you for participating. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so those of you for, who, who noticed that we're laughing a little bit, I didn't really get to introduce her, but my hygienist Debbie is here. With supporting me today, um, and she has worked for my family since before I was born, and she has a wealth of knowledge, and it, I'm just super excited to have her, and you know, what better to have a weekend away out of the office than to Sonoma County, right? Okay. Um, sealant. Where are the pit and fissure sealants in? We have less decay in the pits and fissures, right? We all can, can accept this, that they work pretty well. It's a very important tool in our high-risk kids. This is a fascinating study where they, where they followed these, and 100% of the sealants were effective at 12 months, and 98% of them were effective still at 44 months. They did follow them to make sure that the sealant stayed in good condition, right? So if a sealant was chipping, breaking, lost part of it, they went in there and, and repaired it. But that's really impressive, right? If we're looking at that using the IC-DOS system, zero, zero to four, um, 44 months, 98% effective is pretty impressive data. Um, so this, this is a little graph that shows that, that IC-DOS system. And so the, when we start talking about remineralizing, Ed, right? We have, we have our sealants, we have our drill and fill dentistry. When do we start, talk about remineralizing? This is a study where they took a patient and they followed it and they classified everything under the IC-DOS. Everything was zero to four. They did very small composite sealants. They did microabrasion. They did regular maintenance. And they demonstrated that over, I think it was 28 months, um, that, that this preventative dentistry really kept things at a healthy, moderate level. The really interesting thing, if you read the fine print of this, this study, is they did a food journal, a dietary journal, in this study. And we're gonna talk about that again a little bit later. I keep feeding you things that we're gonna talk about later. I use this a lot in my practice, is dietary food journals. I find this to be super participatory, and it gives me a lot of data, and patients actually do it quite well. So we'll talk about that a little bit later, but that's one of those things that I was excited to see. So this is, this is ADA, again, um, looking at all these things that can be remineralizing silver diamine fluoride, sealants, sodium fluoride, acidulated phosphate fluoride, and our Pro 5000 fluoride gels. All of these they recommend as sort of a remineralizing intervention. 
they recommended against the use of CPP, ACP, or like your MI paste. Uh, so great for many things. It's a product I love for a lot of patients, but it's not going to be something that you're going to see effective remineralization. With huge, huge meta-analysis here where they looked at 48 studies, almost 7,500 participants, over 22 different treatment interventions in 2019, sealants and fluoride varnish, as well as your Pro 5000 gels, were effective for non-cavitated occlusals, proximals, and root caries. Fluoride varnish, super effective for your active white spot lesions, facial or lingual. And your silver diamine fluoride, your important tool when you have those already cavitated big holes in the teeth. So I love looking at this. I love meta-analysis studies, and um, I work a lot with the retirement population. So this really gave me a lot of tools to say that that Pro 5000 gel and sodium or silver diamine fluoride are going to be my my two my two big go-tos. And that, but I think it's great to have this massive amount of data like that to look at. So when do we when do we remineralize versus when do we restore? These are tough questions in dentistry for those of us as dentists. Um, I don't know how many of you guys use a diagnodet pen, but this is an interesting tool versus our bite wings, right? Um, diagnodet pen, pen is super easy on um, pediatric teeth. You can use it on almost all surfaces on pediatric teeth. Great on occlusal surfaces. Um, bite wings is still kind of our go-to tool for knowing what's going on in those interproximal um, surfaces. And, and bite wings are very sensitive for, you know, how sensitive they are for looking at proximal surfaces. Where the diagnodet pin, we know bite wings aren't so useful on occlusals, super sensitive for looking at that on occlusals. So we, studies have shown us that if the lesion is not cavitated, we can still remineralize it. So this idea of is it active or not, how long has it been there or not, it really comes down to is it cavitated or not. This is a big factor in, in our decision to whether or not we're going to remineralize or what sort of treatment action we're going to take. So a big study that looked at this use of orthodontic separators. Besides bite wings, right, how do we look at those interproximal surfaces? I mean, if they have a big hole, they've broken the marginal ridge, okay, we know it's cavitated, right? But how many of those ones that you're surprised when you look on the radiograph and you go, ah, oh, gee, and in the mouth, they look like beautiful teeth, right? How many of you had orthodontic treatment? And orthodontic separators, they suck. They hurt, right? This is not super practical in a clinical way to put in all these orthodontic separators and wait one week and try to look at it. But it does give us some inter interesting data in terms of the studies. So in this school-based study, they did these orthodontic separators. 79, almost 80% of the lesions weren't cavitated. And 90% of them that were E2 weren't cavitated. Well, those of us who were the dental school geeks, and you remember looking at things for the boards, right? You're trying to look, is that an E2? Is that a D1? Where are we really at, right? 90% of those weren't cavitated. They could have some active remineralization. Even at the D1, 66%, only a third of them are cavitated. 66% weren't cavitated. So this idea of when we're looking at the radiograph, is it an E2, is it a D1? doesn't really correlate to whether or not it's cavitated or not. And that is one of those things that should start to affect our decision. So another study they go through, they identify things on the, on the radiograph, they clean things up, they put in those orthodontic separators, they look to try to see, even that millimeter or two that you get with the orthodontic separator, we're like, can you really see that? Well, I mean, it's, it's tough, right? But 508 proximal lesions all the way E1 to D3, only 22% of them were cavitated. Okay, you wouldn't expect much at the, at the E1 or the E2, right? We're below 10%. Okay, D1, that starts to get more interesting to those of us nerdy dentists. 35%, only a third, supports this other study. At D2, we're still below 50% of them were, were cavitated, right? But those of you who are dentists, right, doesn't your stomach start to gurgle a little bit? You're like, 
man, you know, those lesions are oftentimes deeper than they look on the radiograph when we get in there, right? Yeah, that we're walking a fine line of where is that getting to the pulp, right? You know, and what if that young person's going to college and we don't know when we're going to see him again or all that. Okay, D3, we're at 85% of them are cavitated. Well, right then we're already really walking that fine line of the pulp, right? But this D1, D2 region, it starts to get a little fuzzy and a little gray of what do we really do here, right? So these are some radiographs of a young lady that I just saw recently that I really have been looking at that. I haven't started, you know, we've been working on her, on her caries risk and, and all of that stuff. And, and, and we'll come back and maybe talk about her a little bit in the afternoon. But these are some tough decisions of where you, where you have to treat. And, and the ADA and the Council of Scientific Affairs is really starting to make this shift of, of encouraging us to do more remineralization, to do less intervention treatment. Younger dentists seem to be more open to this remineralization than some of us that were like, you know, the GV Black, you know, extension for prevention, right? We got to get, we got to go all the way, drill it out, you know, come on, let's go. Uh, and we've seen lawsuits on both sides of lawsuits for people for over-treating. Well, you shouldn't have treated all those. How come you weren't trying to remineralize? How come you weren't working with the patient? And we see those lawsuits on the under-treating, right? Why were you watching this? You know that's, you're not taking good care of your patient. I'm not gonna stand up here and give you all the answers to that. I think we still have to use our best clinical judgment, right? We have to look at what's going on with that patient. I think we're, what we're gonna talk about today with carries a risk assessment, and with coaching things will give you a lot of data. And my recommendation is, is that you should have their carries risk in there and you should have a conversation about, I don't know maybe whether these are cavitated, we have an option to remineralize, but what's going on in your life? Should we be proactive and treat this, right? If this young lady's going to college starting in August across the country, I might be a little bit more proactive in treating some of those because I don't know when I'm, when I'm going to see her again. So I think we just have to document what are those conversations? What were those things that we went into making the decision of watching and remineralizing or proceeding to treat? Because there is some interesting legal, legal um, cases that are out there and I think that we're seeing a shift in sort of the professional standard of that. So, it makes us all really uncomfortable because we want that cookbook. We want that, this is exactly where I know how to treat. But I just want to make you aware of where we're at with some of that and to just say, take what we discussed today, try to utilize it, and, and just document, document, document as you think about some of these. So if you do choose to drill and fill, when do you stop? Do you scoop with soft stuff and fill it with glass ionomer, or do you take it all out until you have that perfectly normal colored hard dentin? In white spot lesions, whether they were active or not, we know that the bacterial biofilm has penetrated all the way through and into the pulp. It's gone through and at a histological level, we see early pulpal changes. This is a 2020 study that did that whole thing, okay, you get down to sort of that more firm, leathery dentin. What's going on there? Okay, well, they still said there's bacteria in there, and we see all those little inflammatory immune cells in the pulp. One of the interesting things, because I'm this geeky, take care of the old people dentist, is that I wonder how many of those older patients that we have that their pulp is really calcified. It may or may not could be considered vital to our endodontist, but what's going on with, in those cases where we're dealing with the root caries? You know, what's going on at a histological level? Okay, so this is me going way too deep in, and geeking out, but I think these are interesting things to look at. So the bottom line is they're, they're always infected, right? You can choose where you stop, right? We know these treatments, even the scoop and fill with glass ionomer are working in a lot of cases, but you have, once that bacteria has transmitted through those lesions, it's there. You are not disinfecting the lesions. Okay, lots of science, little brain, little brain break here. 
I had an old copy of this, and so I sca it didn't scan in very, very well. But I just think that's the classic. That's the classic. Um, classic comic there. Okay, so we're going to go on to therapeutic strategies. We're just about an hour and twenty-five minutes or so. Everybody feeling okay? Do we want to take a quick little restroom break, or how do we? We're kind of at a decent break for the morning here. Should we do that? Yeah. Okay. Quick break. We'll come back in 10, 15 minutes, Matt. Okay. Yeah.
there. Am I on? OK, great. OK, so this uh, we're going to do some more science and discernment of these th therapeutic strategies here. And then we're going to get some this is a lot more of the fun, fun, fun behavioral stuff and, and um, some of these, these good things. So what do we have to offer as therapeutic agents for these remineralization strategies? We have fluoride. We have antimicrobials. We have xylitol. We have pH buffering. We have nanohydroxyapatite. We have silver diamine fluoride. And we still kind of have probiotic question, right? We'll get into some of that. There's some interesting, interesting stuff. So fluoride. Uh, my friend Brian Novi always likes to ask the permission, can I use the F word at this meeting? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you guys in California, but especially in Oregon up north of here, ooh, this fluoride question gets super political, right? Um, so, so where do we go with this? Um, 1945, Grand Rapids, Michigan was the first city that actually introduced fluoridated water. This is where it really started. But we don't have much data to support this. In fact, there's very little studies that have been done since 1975. Many of the studies that are still cited in these water fluoridation arguments was before we used fluoridated toothpaste. They're not even relevant studies to our lifestyle now. Now we have a lot of processed foods. Are they made with fluoridated water? What, what's going on with that? Is this the sort of an effective way of introducing fluoridation, because we certainly know if foods are being made with fluoridated water, right, we still got plenty of cavities. We established that. So this is the kind of one of the most recent studies we have from the Journal of Dental Research 2018 that said we prevented a fraction of 30% in primary dentition and a permanent in 12% in the permanent dentition. Both of these are significant. So this is the most up-to-date study that we have that says, yes, we do get some benefit from this fluoridated water. So what about antimicrobial strategies? How do we go after all those party player bugs of Scardovia and strep mutans? Oh, I don't know. When I first came out of dental school, right, there was a lot of talk of using chlorhexidine. It was the go-to antimicrobial, perio caries, whatever, right? Slop it on before surgery. Chlorhexidine was your great anti-bug thing. 2020 study using seven days, only seven days. How many times does your periodontist use seven days of chlorhexidine? I still have some arguments with my periodontist about this. Increased the acidic environment. We saw a shift in the microbiome, an increase in dental caries, as well as decreasing those nitrate-reducing bacteria that we want for maintaining good blood pressure and cardiovascular health. Seven days just rinsing with chlorhexidine. Fascinating, right? We learn new things all the time. So it shifts this towards a nitrate-reducing bacteria. Um, it altered the salivary pH. It altered the lactate, the nitrate, and the nitrate um, concentration. So it, it just, it really just went away from this diverse, healthy microbiome that we want. Fascinating information. This was 2021, so another follow-up study. Um, this was Dr. Kuch's non-published study of following some patients in his practice um, where they checkerboarded out the patients to identify all the, the organisms that they could culture in the microbiome over 30 days with the patients using the carry-free treatment rinse, which we'll talk about, but the sodium hypochlorite. The take-home thing that I really want you to think about here he was looking at what are the different bugs that changed or whatever. He didn't even realize this until later. He went back. After 30 days of using that rinse, the number of bacterial species present went up. We got a more diverse microbiome by using an antimicrobial, but with a high pH. Very interesting um, private practice study. So using... Um, Sodium hypochlorite as an antibacterial. Jorgen Slots is sort of the demigod of this, right? He's written a lot of papers about using this imperio, talking about that, that it um, definitely is a good broad antimicrobial, and it doesn't have a lot of side effects. 
and you don't develop sort of resistant bacteria. So this was a study done in Australia using the carry-free sodium hypochlorite treatment rinse where they used it in children for three years, double-blind study. Um, and they reduced the caries index by 73% in these children. That's huge. The other interesting thing is, is that they didn't see any benefit after year two. So it seemed that the shift happened in those first two years. And in my just anecdotal private practice experience on younger kids that all of a sudden you're starting to see or teenagers you're, they were healthy and you're starting to see the shift towards caries on your radiographs or what you're seeing visually oftentimes if they test high for biofilm I can turn this around in three months fairly quickly with the treatment rinse but on those patients that are 60 and have had an acid plaque their whole life it will take a year or two to completely change over that biofilm. And most of us are not very patient, right? <laughs> and sometimes the patient thinks, well, I'm using this antimicrobial, right? It's just killing this, right? Well, yes, it is targeting some of the bacteria in like 30 seconds. We have to think about those biofilms. I like to think about them as those castles like you see in France, right? You've got the ocean and you've got the beach and then you've got the moats and then you've got the walls and you've got the towers and this. This is what these micro biofilms do, right? They build these huge defenses. And we have to slowly change the environment around them and start targeting those and breaking it down. And it takes time. How long does it take time to break down all those stone walls, right? That seems to be the metaphor that works for me. Uh, but fascinating study done in Australia. So this was looking inside the lesions. This is a study using bovine serum albumin. And when they treated it with this sodium hypochlorite, which is very high pH, they saw remineralization within that lesion. So being able to affect the pH within the lesion really affects our power in being able to remineralize. So that's why you'll see when we talk about the usual suspects and all this stuff, we're always going to come back to pH because that pH environment is that driver for all of our therapeutic strategies. Okay, xylitol. We all know and love xylitol, right? If we're, if we're into this xylitol, is our great friend. Um, it is a synergistic with fluoride. So we take you back to your biochemistry classes, that word that you had to memorize, the million steps called glycolysis. Xylitol affects the upper pathway of glycolysis in the bacteria. Fluoride affects the lower part of the pathway of glycolysis in bacteria. So thus we have this synergistic effect of xylitol with fluoride. This is the famous X-ACT study. So a lot of times when we talk about xylitol, this is a study that will come up in a lot of conversations with people who geek out in the science where they followed adults, 691 adults, almost 700 adults for 33 months. They used xylitol lozenges and they did not statistically affect the caries in their adult patients over these 33 months. Okay, kind of disappointing, right? We like our xylitol lozenges. But those patients who used the xylitol lozenges had 40% fewer root caries. So I love this with my higher age population because they have so much dry mouth. They're always going to hard candies or to cough drops or all these things that we see them breaking down even between hygiene visits and we're just going, what happened, right? Xylitol lozenges, big tool for that patient population. Fascinating data out of that exact study. Xylitol has a very antigenic effect on strep mutans, our old friend. Um, but depending on what strain of strep mutans patients have, it can have a different effect. So xylitol could be super effective on one patient and not the same equal effect for another patient. And you need it to be more of a super saturated solution. So to be super effective, in those rinses and gels, we want it to be for 0.4 grams per milliliter, which is about 30% saturation. So we were talking about how you like the carry-free maintenance rinse. It is 30% saturation. It is at that 0.4 grams per milliliter. The scientists there at carry-free have just, they think, figured out how to get it to 40% saturation. Um, we're not sure we can go any higher than that. but. 
many of the products that you see sold at Walmart or in your natural food store, they like to tell xylitol, right? Your patients come in and go, oh, I got this xylitol gum. I got this, this toothpaste says it has xylitol in it. Xylitol is very expensive. And most of the time they put just enough in so that on the label they can say, hey, this is a xylitol product, right? You need to be aware. It really needs to be at the supersaturation level if it's going to be therapeutic for this remineralization. Did any of you guys see the recent headlines about erythritol? Oh, Lord. Okay. So CNN, sugar replacement called erythritol. It's used in a lot of these things that have stevia, monk fruit, keto. It's been linked to blood clotting, stroke, heart attack, and death. Oh, the internet loves these headlines, doesn't it? Your patients are reading these all over Facebook and all over their news feed. Um, wow, that can really affect us. Many of us haven't had a lot of access to a lot of data on erythritol, but the new stuff coming out with it for dentistry is awesome. So I was like, okay, this is, this is interesting. It basically makes the platelet super responsive. So they just they just go crazy with clotting. And when these patients have had a certain amount of the erythritol, they can last in their system for three to four days. Okay, let's put this in perspective. This was only noted in patients who were very high risk. So uncontrolled diabetic, already had high cardiovascular. None of this has been studied in the healthy patients formally and published yet. So we only have those patients that we know are pretty high risk of throwing a clot. Anyway. Right, and so they're using it to bake because erythritol bakes really well and it, and it you know, is a very, very sweet, so they like it, so they're ingesting it, right? Again, we don't have a good study about this in the normal patient. We are using erythritol topically in dentistry, right? So not a risk that we're going to get such a dramatic systemic effect. But this is in the main news media, so you need to be aware of this. You need to be able to speak about this with your patients if they come in, especially your diabetic patients. So this was a 2020 study that I found looking at what's going on with erythritol. So they, they were combining these kind of polyols, right? We know in a lot of these foods they like to combine these various um, alcohol sugars. So if you had high amounts of, of erythritol with xylitol, it was more effective against strep mutans. And if you had higher amounts of xylitol combined with erythritol, it was really good with strepsobrinus or Scardovia wigsii. Again, great fascinating evidence that every one of us is unique, right? And we can't use the same tool for every single person. So um, there's, I know that there's products in development in dentistry that are talking about using erythritol with xylitol because we know, hey, we can start to have a broader spectrum antimicrobial. Because of some of this new stuff and from a sales and marketing point of view, some of that might get halted or, um, or put on the shelf. But interesting stuff. I thought it was very timely and I wanted to share it, share it with you guys. Okay, we keep coming back to pH, right? Kaiser so say it's always about the pH. Why does pH matter? Because when we have a pH that's in that neutral to alkaline zone, we can start to shift that biofilm, right? We don't have to kill everything off and try to rebuild it. We can start to, to shift it. And um, so it's this idea of control without killing. This pH really matters. It re matters for remineralization, for shifting the biofilm. And I think that um, we've used baking soda a long time in our practice, Debbie, and just that shift of getting them more alkaline, I think that alone, without always inter putting those remineralizing agents, have we started to see positive results for some of that. So you, you will see a lot of patients in our practice brush with baking soda only. They've gotten rid of all the toothpaste. And we know that pH really accelerates this remineralization. So if we want to take those patients that are walking that fine line, we really want to try to avoid that, that drill and fill, really starting to acknowledge and educate your patient and talk about what's going on with that pH uh, really matters within that, within that, um, that lesion and what's going on with those, with those ions. Okay, so that being said, do you know the pH of all those products that line the shelf in the Walmart pharmacy? 
I don't. In fact, I've been threatening to buy a fancy pH meter, so when my patients bring all this crap into my office, I'm going to say, stick it here. See, this sucks. <laughs> Because we don't know. So we need to be careful, right? Because our patients are really trying all these different things. They see the latest fad on Facebook or whatever. And, and, and when we're talking about this carry control, what's going on with pH matter? It really matters in my population because I've got lots of root surfaces exposed and we've got to keep it at 6.7 or higher or we're losing ground faster than we know what to do with. Um, so what are the products pH? This is just a list of some of these. You can see that, geez, many of them are down 6.3, 5.4. One of them's at 4. I love this. It says Elmex Erosion Protection, pH of 4. <laughs> I that's from Switzerland. I really thought the Swiss were smarter than that. But anyway, um, the carry free spray is at 9.9. .9. They try to make everything super, super high pH, rain. Um, the spray product is at 7.1. Elevate Oral Care has all day spray, which we've been finding provides the longest lasting relief for that burning dry mouth for our patients. You can get it on Amazon. So we've been super good fans of all day spray. It's neutral as well. And then what about those dry mouth patients that are always going around carrying around their bottle of water, right? Like we've got this, what are all the waters? Water is water is water is water, right? That's what I thought. I had a lady early on in my practice, <laughs> sweet older lady, lots of root surfaces, getting carries all the time. And she loved to put the water enhancers, in, like the flavor enhancers in her water, right? And I was smart enough to realize that crystal light isn't gonna do anything with your teeth, right? And so then she comes to me well, all excited one day, okay, I found this Metro Mint water at Safeway and I love it. Okay, bring me a bottle of it. And it just says water and mint. And I said, okay, that's cool. That looks good to me, right? It's got to be better than Crystal Light. She was buying this by the cases. She even brought a case to the office so we could share it with the team and with our patients. I didn't realize for like two more years that pH of water can be very different when they go through all these deionizations and all these treatments and all these things. And finally, when I figured it out, I felt horrible, and I'm like, Marianne, you have to throw out all your Metro water. Like, I've been telling you all wrong. This is hurting your teeth. This is part of why we're not winning this battle. Of course, she was very upset with me, but we finally, we finally got through it. So, so that's my, that's my go-to. But most of the bottled waters are a pH of four, unless they publish the pH, and it says that it was alkaline. Um, we were laughing about this because Debbie got me <laughs> this bottle of water, which Smart Water has the black one, right, that we know is a high pH. And this one says it's purely balanced pH. So we're assuming maybe it's 7, but I'm not sure. And now I want to take a little strip and, and test it here when it <laughs> these, these days. But being really aware of what your patients are drinking in terms of their pH matters. It is good, isn't it? Metro Mint is it's tasty, yeah. <laughs> But not so good for remineralization. <laughs> okay, what about nanohydroxyapatite? Just in the last couple months, I feel like, I'm seeing a lot more in the mainstream media talking about hydroxyapatite. Interesting little ads popping up on my Facebook feed, and it's becoming this thing. There's been a ton of stu studies published in the last couple of years. It's the most studied sort of bio biologic material in, in some of the in the in some of the material science. Um, this this is talking about Edwina Kidd. She's one of the authors of this textbook, Dental Carries. Uh, so when we got shut down in the 2020 pandemic, I ordered this textbook off of, of Amazon and it's like my go-to thing. And so here I am when I'm not working, um, all geeked out with this this textbook on my on my patio and um, and unless, if you dental hygienists think you're not geeky enough, Debbie was so jealous that I ordered it that she got it too. Um, <laughs> um, I think I've read a little bit more of it than she has, though. It's, it, it, it can put you to sleep a little bit. Um, anyway, Edwina Kidd talks about what's going on with saliva and that it's super saturated to hydroxyapatite. If it was not, our teeth would not stay hard. And so when our teeth demineralize, we sort of think they're just 
ionizing out, right? These little things like we used to see in chemistry class, they're just floating off into space in our mouth, right? But really it's not. It's really that we're breaking off hydroxyapatite crystals at a 20 nanometer size. So how do we get those back, right? And so this is a study looking in the lab, um, one of the early studies of remineralization, very consistent in enamel with, with hydroxyapatite nanocrystals. Um, another study looking at it using Pro 5000 gel that has the nanohydroxyapatite in it, we see that after um, it was treated that we saw remineralization of that. But back to that, that 20 nanometers, it's really important. Again, just like talking about how xylitol was expensive in some of these products, nanohydroxyapatite is expensive in some of these products. So if you start to look at the new ones that are being advertised on these, these Facebook ads or these targeted things that you get, and you start to look at the price point of some of these, many of them are clearly not getting nanohydroxyapatite. They're getting appetite we don't know what form it's in, we don't know what the size it's in but you really want to have this biological size. Um, and I think we were looking one up, wasn't one of them 80 nanometers that we looked up that was one of the competitors? It's, it's one of them said 20 to 80. Yeah, so it's variable, you don't know. And again, it's kind of that cost. So looking at what the cost point is can be a great, a great judge for that, but it's really important that we want it in that biological form so that those, those can start to to come back. And so in a lot of the lab studies, it's showing superiority to remineralization compared to fluoride. It, it's, um, like I said, it's really good. It's becoming um, um, also really help useful for the sensitivity of teeth. Um, this one looked at comparing it with um, fluoride to the, some of the C ACP and CP CPP um, things. And we just know that the hydroxyapatite and the fluoride together, if we get the pH right, are really great therapies. Um, this one compared the, the dentifrices, um, and we saw remineralization with all of them, um, the fluoride ones and just the Novamin ones, but nanohydroxyapatite kind of blows it out of the water in terms of results in, in remineralization. But all of, them, all of them are a positive thing. This is 2023, so one of the few actual 2023 studies that I, that I get to include in this, in this lecture. Um, out of the journal Biomimetrics, and um, it was talking about this as being a desensitizer, right? It goes back to all the political things and the fluoride things, right, and some of these things, right? We like to say things are desensitizers. This sells well and it goes over well, you know, with FDA and all these kinds of things. So this one so shows it being really superior as a desensitizer. They're showing some preliminary data that it might be effectively in whitening teeth. Of course, we like to go for those marketing things, but we need a little bit more, a little bit more evidence. Um, in rinses, it, they're not as statistically significant in terms of remineralization, but it didn't seem to matter what the, the concentration was. So when we went back to some of the xylitol and some of that, where concentration matters, not quite as much data um, as effective in the rinses. Okay, um, silver diamine fluoride. I think probably a lot of practices now are starting to use silver diamine fluoride, but it is an expensive thing, so it's just like you got to kind of weigh it and how you're using it and know how to use it. But is it really antibacterial? Um, and the answer is yes, it does like to disrupt the cell membrane and the genetic replication processes of the bacteria. So it is an effective antibacterial agent. It produces fluorohydroxyapatite in the tooth when we apply it. So that's good, right? That's really helpful for that remineralization, that changing what's going on in the lesion. Um, it reduces the solubility of that lesion. This is a really cool scanning electron microscope that shows that the silver is traveling into those detonal tubules and oxidizing in there, sort of creating these threads into those detonal tubules essentially then acting to sort of arrest or slow this um, decay process. And so super important for those patients that have a hard time getting into the office, sitting through dental care, those young kids, those elderly patients, 
you know, are we truly arresting the cavity, right? Well, we can get into the arguments of all that, but it's definitely, it's definitely slowing it. Uh, <laughs> one of the, when it first came available, you know, through Advantage Arrest in the United States, a dentist from a few towns over that was recently retired brought his elderly mother in, and she had this huge hole in tooth number two. Didn't hurt her, but this just this this huge hole, and she was frail, and you're trying to avoid putting her through oral surgery and all this kind of stuff. So <laughs> I said to the dentist, hey, have you heard of silver diamine fluoride? Well, yeah, I've kind of heard about it, but I never worked with it in my practice. Okay. Should we try it on your mom? Let's see how long we can keep this hole in the tooth, in her head, without it hurting, getting infected, causing anything like that. It was years, I think it was about five years, and she ended up going to the grave with tooth number two, with the ginormous hole in it, that we put silver diamond fluoride in, it never bothered. There were some other teeth that had much lesser visible holes that we ended up having to take out because they were causing pain. Um, from abscesses and various things. But this particular one, my little experiment tooth, went all the way to her grave with that. So it is, I think it's a, I think it's a really important, important tool, kind of on those end of life spectrums, right? Early in life and end of life spectrums of our. This is a really interesting one. So a immunocompromised patient, you know, decay everywhere, right? What do you think from the usual suspects? Sugar. <laughs> um, but, but really showing that it is a caries control strategy for us uh, in those in those patients. There's a new version that's coming out in a gel now, which I'm super excited about. Um, I think it's going to be a lot easier to use. You know those little drops and you're trying not to drop it on your clothes and on your countertop because it will it will leave a mess. Um, but we know it's a super effective, efficient agent for controlling. Um, there's people out there that try to market and say that it doesn't turn it black. <laughs> Have you ever seen one that didn't turn black? <laughs> so yeah, exactly. If it's non carious lesion, it doesn't turn it black. <laughs> it will turn it black, and it will turn your clinic jacket black, and it will turn your floor black, and it will turn your countertop black. And we have a few little special streaks in some of our rooms that is where it, it uh, didn't get carefully handled. Um, I, they, there's very few side effects. They talk about gum pain, gum swelling, gum bleaching. I have seen a couple instances where I got a little bit of gum bleaching. It doesn't seem to bother patients. It, it really, overall, works really well. Enamel lesions seem to be really sensitive and, and really effective um, to that uh, in those high risk in those high risk patients. And don't you love scientists? In this randomized clinical trial, silver diamine fluoride with fluoride varnish was non-inferior to sealants and atraumatic restorations. <laughs> the bottom line, it works, right? All these tools are tools in our tool chest, right? We can do sealants in those high-risk kids. We can do atraumatic restorations in some of these patients that can't sit through a whole restorative patient. The silver myamine fluoride needs to be in our, in our tool chest to, to arrest and prevent. So for those of you who maybe haven't used it, what is the protocol you want to, to, as best you can, dry the teeth and the tooth surfaces, apply that SDF. I'm super excited to have it in the gel. I haven't gotten any yet, but um, it's coming and scrub it into the lesion as much as you can, especially in those deeper holes in the teeth, you know, getting it in there. You, you can apply fluoride varnish if you want or not. Um, I think it's great in kids because you really want to get that in. Some of those adult patients hate the feel of fluoride varnish, and so sometimes they're like, no, 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 don't get me that stuff. Um, if possible, try to apply it again in two weeks. Many a times in our patients who come on the bus from these nursing homes or whatever, getting them right back in two weeks is not always possible, but we oftentimes have them coming in every three to four months, so we just try to get it, try to get it in there if we can, and twice a year if possible. Yeah. That's a great question. I don't have an answer to that. I have not looked at a, any studies. It would be an interesting thing to plug in and see if anybody has um, has studied it. And you're kind of thinking in terms of, you know, getting rid of some of the bacteria, desensitizing those, and and all that. So I think I think it's a great question. Of course, a lot of those fractured teeth are in the front, right? And so sometimes those are aesthetic concerns. You know, if you put your curing light, if you apply it as almost of a cavity light, or if you ever made this mistake. I got, I got really smart early on, and I'm like, oh, I'm just going to put this in as a cavity liner, and then I'm going to put my restoration in it. Uh. 
hot mess that it will take you a long time to clean up and you have a mad patient. So you do have to sort of think about some of those aesthetic concerns. But in terms of a scientific study that looked at, specifically, does it work for those fractured teeth? I don't have, I don't have an answer. But I'll let you know if I find out. Okay, <laughs> okay so, so what, about, what about probiotics, right? Uh, there still seems to be sort of this unsure science and a lot of the probiotics there's still not a lot I mean there's not a lot of great great stuff that I I have seen come out this one is this one is um, really interesting it's kind of almost like that chlorhexidine thing that lactobacillus rhamnosus induced mineral loss in dentin cavities and created a highly karyogenic uh, environment it didn't do anything on strep mutans um, so actually might help your gut maybe but it's probably not helping your helping your teeth and there was a new one that I just um, pulled out here this this one actually came out in 2017 and it was just a lab study and it was with lactobacillus salivarius and I thought this was really interesting because it inhibited the karyogenic biofilm formation of candida albicans and strep mutans but again it was just a lab test so we it's never been tested to say are we reducing the caries index in a patient population? But kind of some interesting, interesting little tidbits there. This one is actually the most exciting one, an interesting one, and that is using probiotic milk. Now, I've never seen Darigold probiotic milk labeled in my grocery stores in my small town, but we're looking at fermented milk. So a lot of kefir, some of these things you'll see in the natural foods section, you want the fermented milk. But when they gave it to preschool kids daily or three times weekly, they got a modest prevention of new caries, but they considerably reversed existing caries. Now that's interesting, especially on those patients that can't afford to get, you know, a lot of the extra treatments you're necessarily seeing them on a regular basis, those busy families that sort of come in and out. What a great recommendation to be able to make, right? This is. This is a really um, fascinating thing, 2020 study. Um, pretty compelling results that we're reversing it just with probiotic milk and super easy um, to implement. Okay, we went through a lot of therapeutic strategies, a lot of science, a lot of stuff. That's kind of the hardest science. How's everybody, how are you feeling? Any questions, anything? I have a question. Okay. Yeah, so it's by Elevate Oral Care, oh, wow. and they call it All Day Spray. Oh, wow. And it wasn't on that chart, but okay, yeah, thank you. yeah. It's a low do SPF. Yeah. Direct. Yeah. And I think it's forty percent better. Yeah. Great. Point. Yeah, it seems it seems to last longer than some of the other sprays, and so we've tended to get a more positive response. And my father, the dentist who has dry mouth, is, you know, my test. My guinea pig for a lot of these things. He likes it, so dentist approved. <laughs> okay, so let's start to get into some of these behavioral strategies and some of these other things that go into our into our patient process of of dealing with some of this stuff. Um, so what what are some of the modifiable behaviors versus the non modifiable behaviors, right? dog following you to the bathroom. What role does mom play? Primary caregivers. If they've had carious lesions in the last four months, or 12 months, excuse me, you have more than double the odds of seeing caries in the young person. And that's not just mom. Oftentimes it's mom, but it's the primary caregiver. So different cultures will sometimes have different primary caregivers. We're seeing more dads staying at home. So so different families. So looking at the primary caregiver, we can make a big difference by starting to catch these early when we're getting um, into those. You have a question? Yes, from here, actually. Uh, we, what are your thoughts regarding yogurt and probiotic benefits? Ah, okay. So the question is, what are the thoughts of yogurt and probiotic benefits? Um, two things. From a scientific point of view, I have not seen any studies that looked specifically at that. This, this one with the fermented milk is the only one that I've seen. Um, look at that. In terms of yogurts, I think what we really have to be careful with is the sugar content, right? Anytime we have fruits added, what's being added to it. Very few people, especially kids, like those plain 
plain yogurts because they're more sour. And so I, my caution would be what, what is, what's getting added to the yogurt and some of that. So great question though, great question. Okay, so primary caregivers, moms, we want to look at that because we can make a huge difference on what our expected outcomes is for the young, the young child. Um, this was a Dutch study looking at nocturnal bottle feeding. Of course, most of us are aware of bottle, bottle, baby bottle tooth decay, as well as prolonged breastfeeding, which they defined as greater than 12 months. I had to go back and look at, look at that. Um, and there's a lot of talk about breastfeeding, right? And so it's, I almost sometimes hesitate to bring this up because it, it kind of jostles a few young moms and breastfeeding kids. Um, but in this study, they show breastfeeding beyond 12 months, of course, when we typically start to have teeth and nocturnal bottle feeding increased um, the risk for caries in the dental kids. What about that toothbrushing, right? I think we can all agree that if we increase our toothbrushing, we bring down our caries index scores. What about diet? What's going on with all the diet, right? Is the produce section usually the most crowded section of the grocery store? <laughs> So this is Dr. Rob Lustig. He is a pediatric neuroendocrinologist at UCSF, and he wrote this book, I think it was out in 21, called Metabolical. Just buy it. It's a great, great read. Um, he basically has just been so frustrated with the changes in health and sort of the political food culture in our country that he's just a one-man band trying to go after big food, big sugar. Um, and this is a picture with um, Kim Cooch and Doug Thompson and Doug Young, some of the, some of the gurus in, in cariology and wellness and dentistry. Uh, but he's really, he's really trying to make a big difference. So at that neurological level, sugars and sweet response is stronger than cocaine. We are, we're just more addicted to sugar than even cocaine. So that's a big battle, right? Like we know how hard it is for patients that are had substance abuse or addictive, we're really dealing with a big, with a big battle when it comes to sugar. Um, the, the World Health Organization recommends that free sugar should be less than 10% of your dietary energy. I don't know a practical way of uh, <laughs> measuring this in a daily life, but this is the guidelines put out by the World Health Organization. In children, if we have a frequent intake of, of sugar and beverages over a period of time, we see a 54% increase in those DMFT scores. And this is talking about the amount of sugar. Do we, do we, um, do we increase those, those caries amounts um, versus how much sugar we're intaking? This is a tough one, right? Because we have studies that say, yeah, if you eat a lot more sugar, you get a higher caries, right? We have a lot of studies that show the frequency of it. So which one do we really focus on, right? And I think when you put it all together, it comes back to that classic BIPA home study, right? The frequency of those sugars. If you have a certain amount of sugars in your meals versus the frequency of sugar, it's that frequency that it's a big deal. If you're going to eat sugar, have it with a meal. It's, it's just going to be much more effective in your, in your caries outcome. <laughs> so remember that our, our sugar thing here, right? <laughs> like this is in the can. This is how much is in just one can of a lot of that stuff that's in the in the mini mart at your at your gas station, right? And and so the orthodontist across the parking lot from me had <laughs> had a board up like this. <laughs> and and I forget which one he had that was down here, right, at the lowest amount. It was like a Gatorade or something. He ended up taking the board down because the moms were saying, oh, that's really great to know. I'll only buy Gatorade now for my kid. They missed the point. <laughs> he just took it down. He just is like, this is not. But we have a poster in at least one of our hygiene rooms that has, has all the drinks and the amount of sugar. And it really, it really starts a lot of conversation. Um, with patients. It's amazing how little they understand about what's in those ingredients. And, and we'll, we'll go through some slides later that, that, that look at that. So we know that the sugar sweetened beverages are a huge contributor to what's going on in our diabetes epidemic, right? And we're not making huge strides in our caries either. So this is, this is one of those big players and it really contributes to a lot of mortality and frailty amongst U.S. adults. I mean, how many of these patients do you see sometimes 
still really in middle age, right? And they look sick. And they're taking a lot of medication. And they have a high sugar diet. Um, this study was just interesting in terms of saying, hey, if we would just take some of these generalized dietary councils that our government organizations put out, we'll have a lot less calories <laughs> in, our, in our society. So the, so the big battle that we have, have to do. Um, and what about saliva? We talked about 70% 70, 70 of Americans are taking at least one, one prescription medication. Uh, this was a, another meta-analysis that looked at a systematic review of 99 papers and all those medications that affect our saliva, right? So we've nervous system, cardiovascular, genitourinary, musculoskeletal, respiratory, and alimentary. What's not on there? Skin. <laughs> it's about the only one that didn't dramatically affect our saliva. <laughs> so I just, you could just look at that metal history really quickly. If it's a dermatological medication, okay, fine. If it's anything else, it's affecting their saliva, right? Um, you're going to have that, have that drier mouth. This one they talked about only 19% of, of elderly patients reported xerostomia, and a lot of it was related to gastrointestinal um, medications. I think when you look at your patient population, at least mine in a retirement town, the amount of people who have xerostomia is more like about 90%. <laughs> but interesting that only 19% are self-reporting that. So this consciousness, this awareness that they might have dry mouth and how that's changing um, is, I, is an interesting concept, I think, for us to be aware of. Yes? Mm -hmm. Gosh, I'm not sure. I haven't I haven't looked super recently on on the website. Um, so you have to check out the website. If not, I'm sure that they can they can get it. They're they're super helpful about emailing that stuff. Um, but I, the last I checked, it's like well over 500 medications. It's it's crazy, crazy long. I mean, like I said, when you go back and look at these all those systems of medication, <laughs> you can. You could pretty well be assured that that most of them are, and the, and we're in allergy season, right? Mm -hmm. How many people are popping those antihistamines every day? Huge, <laughs> huge dry mouth thing, right? I'm so aware of it, I can't even take them because my mouth feels so dry, I can't stand it, and so I'm just like, okay, I'll just let my nose, my nose drip. <laughs> um, and then of course we have the patients with Sjogren's, right? What's what are all the complications in their health with those, with those? with those Sjogren's patients. Um, we just had one of our severe Sjogren patients in the office this last week, super timely right before this seminar. She didn't have any new cavities, which was so exciting because even though you're throwing everything and the kitchen sink at it in those patients, it's so hard. But um, we updated her caries risk assessment and it turned out, um, and you can correct me on this Debbie, her doctor has instructed her to drink Gatorade because her sodium was a little bit low. <laughs> and I'm like, can you just put some salt and water, please? Like, throw out the Gatorade for crying out loud. We'll look at that in a little bit. But it's like, so that, again, it just really demonstrated how just doing that quick form, where she filled it out, brought up that conversation. Debbie, you've seen her for years, every three months. And all of a sudden, this had shifted and changed and probably wouldn't have come nat naturally in that conversation if we hadn't spent that 30 seconds to, to update that carries risk assessment form. So those Sjogren's patients are, are, are a challenge. Methamphetamine users, right? Um, always a challenge if you're in some of those practices that, that see a lot of that, that population. It makes them crave sugar. So not only do we have the effects of the drugs, but we tend to have a high sugar, high soda intake um, as well. Um, and cognitive impairment. Um, this is a huge challenge that I wish I had some better answers for, because I see see so many of um, so many of my patients just struggling to remember what what to do. But we know that that's that's a huge increase in caries because are they even remembering to do their basic brushing? And these are people who were really on it, right? They were they would be sort of horrified to see what they're just simply not remembering. So it, those are really hard things and it takes a lot of kindness and patience and, 
and uh, we haven't figured out any great, great effective tips other than just trying to get them into the into the hygiene schedule as frequently as as possible. And those children with special needs, um, oftentimes treatment is difficult, so silver diamine fluoride could be helpful. Getting them in more regular, using those fluoride varnishes, all of those things are going to be be effective. Um, and of course, there's a many different categories of that. You know, um, many of the classic Down syndrome kids, I think, you see an excess of saliva, right? And a lot of them actually do <laughs> quite well, despite that there's a lot of plaque on their teeth. You know, they do quite well. So another interesting category of, of these behaviors. So again, going back to the usual suspects, what are those things that we can, that we can really modify? And diet and home care are those two, those big behavioral factors that we can that we can start um, to modify. So how do we do that? Um, we'll talk a little bit about this afternoon after a lunch break of kind of getting into the wellness coaching, but it's really using specific language to try to help the patient self-identify with their problems, make it really personalized to them, and empower them to make sustainable changes um, in, the, in the thing. So where did this idea that a habit develop? We can, we can change a habit in 21 days. Do you know where this came from? So this crazy book in 1960, it was a plastic surgeon. He observed that it took 21 days for his patients to get used to their new noses. We call that crap science. <laughs> in reality, <laughs> when it's been studied in, in uh, social psychology circles, it takes anywhere from 66 to 250 days of consistently working on this to try to make this habit automatic, right? And we'll talk about some tools around that this <laughs> afternoon. But this idea that if we can just get our patients to do this or whatever for 21 days, yeah, not. Uh, not going to be so so easy to do. Um, this is an interesting one um, from the Journal of Dental Hygiene, looking at orthodontic patients of, hey, we've all got this cell phone in the pocket, right? Every single one of you either have it in your hand or right in front of you, right? How can we start to use this as a tool to have a supportive effect on our patient behaviors? And so this idea of remote control and using reminders or text messages or many of the these fancy toothbrushes now have apps that do all kinds of little things for young people to brush. I think we need to not overlook this ubiquitous piece of technology we have and the power it could have in some of this behavioral modification. Uh, interesting study that talks about how you know, dietary coaching and some of this stuff can be very effective in dental offices, especially if we're trying to get people to eat fresher, healthier foods. Maybe eliminate a little alcohol consumption. We don't do that around Walla Walla or Sonoma, I'm sure. Um, but when it comes to sugar, right, it's like cocaine. It's a hard thing to affect behavioral change when it comes to sugar, right? This is our challenge, um, that so many things are easier to change um, than sugar. So as part of the coaching process, we want to start to ask open-ended questions. I'm curious about what would you like to focus on? How has this affected your life? Tell me more about that. So just like we talked about saliva diet biofilm, here's your other three things to carry it into the coaching question. How, what, and tell. These are really great little keywords to remember how you start your questions uh, so that you can do that. And we'll dive into that a little bit more this afternoon. But we are always so in a rush to solve the problem as healthcare practitioners, right, that we, we tend to like to just tell people how it is. <laughs> and we really need to empower them to self-identify and, and own these, these things, right? It's not our teeth. It's their teeth. I'm going to worry about my teeth. You need to worry about your teeth, right? More coaching language. That's interesting. Tell me more about that. Or what else? They might tell you something. Oh, well, you know, I work nights and I go to work and I drink a Red Bull. Well, tell me more about that. Do you drink anything else during the night while you're at work? Right? You're just simply getting on their level, finding out what's going on in their life. Um, and you'll be amazed what, what you can learn. Um, 
these are some of the steps that we kind of talk about in the coaching conversation of this idea that if we tell somebody, hey, you have four cavities in your teeth. How do you feel, right? You feel a little bit judged, like, oh, well, like, what's, I got this. What do I do with this, you know? Um, it's going to hurt, right? Um, but if you say, I found, so they do the carries risk assessment, and you say, I found that you're, you, you said that you were snacking quite a lot during the day, and that's a significant risk factor for developing cavities. I'm concerned about that. It feels less judgmental, right? It's all of a sudden like, oh, well, what's going on with that? Um, I think as part of this shift in, in making it personalized and participatory, that I really try to avoid putting a number, right? We go back and talking about caries as, okay, it's a cavities in the teeth, or it has to do with these surfaces, or all these things that we like to input in our chart, right? We're very data-driven that way. And I tr I've tried to stop using the numbers of, oh, you have three cavities, or, oh, guess what? This time you didn't have any cavities. Congratulations. But, but really just talking about, what are those risk factors? So you're enabling that confidence or that motivation to change depending on what you, what you found. And then giving the control to the patient. We talk about this a lot in coaching training, right? Your patient or your client. We like to be in control. We're the doctor, we're the hygienist, we're the educated ones, you know? But really people only make effective decisions when it's them, right? They're choosing this and, and it's about them. So which one would you like to work on first? Sometimes they're not going to pick the one you wish they did. But if you roll with it, we'll start to see change. Having them articulate the plan. What is your plan? Um, letting them talk, work through it. And it might require some education along the way because they don't always know what, what they might want to change. But getting them to articulate what is their plan to, to, to start to address. And then the great thing as a coach is you're supporting. What support would you like from me? Again, it's not, it's not giving them that checklist. You're not handing them that letter of those 19 things of this is what I want you to work on for the next six months, right? <laughs> but really giving them, them that control. And, and over time, you'll be amazed what, what a change in the journey that, that has. OK, so back to our usual suspects here, right? We're going to keep coming back to this. What are those patterns that we're going to recognize? Saliva, diet, and biofilm. We're going to recognize that genetics is that player that always interacts with all of that. And if we're going to make any change 100% of the time, what do we have to do? We have to think about the pH, right? Kaiser Sose, the person, the person who is always responsible there. So what do we want to do with some of those treatment strategies, right? If they have that dry mouth, Certainly, we want them hydrating with good water, right? Not pH 4 water. We want to neutralize with some of these products that we can do that we've studied the pH about and, and what can we do to stimulate that saliva, right? With lozenges or xylitol gum or some of those things. For diet, are we going to limit sweets or are we going to change the snacking schedule, right? That's kind of where we have to go. Is it the dose or the frequency, right? Those are our two tools that we have to work on. When it comes to the behavior, what about, are we going to work with the oral hygiene, the plaque control, or are we going to actually employ an antimicrobial to, to help us to change that, that biofilm? And then with genetics, we want, we want to work with that pH, right? We, want to, we kind of want to know. We, don't, we can't study. We don't know specifically in all these patients which, which genes are being effective. So we want to minimize the acid, and we want to support those wellness strategies. So protocols, if they're in that low-risk range, we're, gonna, we're going to 12-month fluoride varnish, if they're interested, we're going to offer these products, and we're going to educate them about their risk factors. They may be still in balance, but, it, but they might be kind of on the edge of one of these risk factors. And if we start to, to educate them about what these risk factors are, they're more likely to identify a change when they come in the next time. And so educating them about what those risk factors are to look for in the future. For the moderate risk, Try to do six-month fluoride varnishes if you can to get that extra fluoride boost. Recommend those products that have a good pH, that have the xylitol, the nanohydroxyapatite, um, and the fluoride. Start to work with some of that remineralization in those. And then really look at those risk factors and personalize them in that coaching. 
so that they start to, to, to own them and to feel empowered to make some change in that. And the high carries risk, right? We got to pull out all the stops, right? If possible, try to get them in every three months for that fluoride varnish. Um, not only because it's just the fluoride, because it's getting you in front of them to start to, to continue to review those behavioral things and have a coaching thing. And I'm going to do a truly honest disclosure here, right? We've just, we're still coming out of all this COVID. We still haven't dealt with all our hygiene backup. <laughs> it's like, we don't, we're short of our hygienists. We're trying to do a, we've had a huge shortage of staff in general, right? I have not been able at a realistic level in my practice to get a lot of these patients in at three months. It's just, it's just not, not hands on deck, but we certainly are always trying, trying to do that. We want them on those Pro 5000 toothpaste. We want them on the high pH products. We want to throw every remineralization agent that we have at it, right? Based on your caries risk assessment, are you going to do an antimicrobial strategy? Are you going to add that? Some of your high risk patients may not have a biofilm problem. So you have to look at that and decide, is this one of those ones that you want to do that? Um, do you need to do some caries control because you got a flaming hot mess in there, right? Are we going to add some of that silver diamine fluoride to buy us some time to start to implement these things? Many of these patients have delayed for so long. You know, we can't, we can't change everything at the speed that we would like to. And then really working with that behavioral coaching on the targeted risk factors, right? We might have multiple risk factors, but if we can start to bring a little bit down one at a time, you know, faster than you realize, right? We'll start to see, we'll start to see positive, positive changes in, in some of those those patients. Okay, any other questions here? We're kind of wrapping up a little of this. Is, this, is it kind of start to, we're circling back and kind of starting to, to make, make some sense with this. So um, a few of our takeaways, dental caries is still one of the most undertreated diseases in the world. It is not just holes in your teeth, right? We are, we are looking at this as a whole person disease. And it is a pH-driven biofilm disease. That biofilm really shifts based on what's going on in the pH of the mouth as well as our therapeutic strategies. And what are we going to do? We're going to make it predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory. So this shift to a much more personalized, specific medicine using our caries management strategy, right? It's a really quick and easy tool to get us there. And then what are our usual suspects, right? That we're always going to go back and look at saliva, diet, biofilm. This is what you should be thinking about as you assess every patient. And then what we've talked about this morning, what kind of strategies are we going to do there in terms of reparative and, and therapeutic um, and behavioral strategies. Um, Dr. Michael Ortiz uh, has this great saying, and he says, there are two words that will open every door for you. Push and pull. <laughs> I think when we talk about working with our patients with this, like sometimes we feel like we're pushing and sometimes we feel like we're pulling and we're always having to adjust and all this kind of stuff, right? But it does open a lot of, it does open a lot of doors. The dogs like to pull. There's a lot of pulling. Um, um, again, uh, if you want a free copy of the book, we have them here. Your dental society has a lot of them. You can. You can order them, and they have been a great spot. You can get a free um, webinar for your office to talk about how to implement these in your practice, and um, and and that's that's a great thing. So that is kind of the first morning session. We can roll through and do a little segment about some sports drinks now or after lunch. Does anybody have a the organizers here want to weigh in? <laughs> should we should we keep rolling for a little bit? Go till noon? Yeah. All right. So what about these sports programs and all these things that we that we drink and how how athletes are doing all some of this? We'll we'll talk a little bit more about this this afternoon too. Well, I need to get some water too. So what are these Caries and erosion risks that we see here. We have calories, sugars, pH, and caffeine, which is an interesting player as well. Um, again, we know that sugar-sweetened beverages are this huge caloric intake that are really causing a lot of problems in our society, as well as dental caries and mortality and frailty. 
So in these sports things, this is a super interesting um, study of looking at sports guards versus drinks versus exercise, right? And so in the control, if you just put in a mouth guard and you have them exercising, the pH stays actually really pretty good in the mouth, right? You're not tending to dry it out by breathing through the mouth and all these kinds of things. But if you add a sugary drink, then you throw in the mouth guard, and then you go run and exercise and play these sports, we saw a sustained level below pH of 5.5. Right? We all believe sports guards save teeth, right? We, we've all been called in on those emergency traumas, right? We, we, we need to promote that. But going the little extra way and trying to figure out what's being promoted by these coaches, what's going on, what are they drinking, and how do they do it? How many times have we watched these sports on TV, right? They're flipping out the mouth guard, they're drinking the Gatorade, they're sticking that back in, right? We see a lot of high carries risks in athletes. I don't know if you saw one of those statistics. I forget which Olympics it was, but there was a group of dentists that went to one of the Olympics. And many of these athletes come from countries where they have very few resources. And they just did like hundreds of these athletes in terms of dentistry and helping them. And so it's like we know these athletes unfortunately suffer more dental problems than than we wish, right? And so we come back to this idea of pH, these fermentable if you're changing the, the sal saliva, working it, overstimulating, breathing through the mouth, we're, we're going to be really shifting that pH um, in the biofilm. High fructose corn syrup, we talked about that. Uh, it, strep mutans likes that. It's not picky. And caffeine increases that metabolism. So remember we were talking about it reproducing, producing more energy, creating this, inviting all its friends to the party. And so caffeine is a player, and I think it, you'll see in some of this, but as we start to look, as you pay attention in the grocery store and in some of these stores, a lot more of these drinks that are advertised as sports drinks are adding caffeine or they have a caffeinated version in that. So I think that's an interesting, interesting thing to, to be aware of. Um, so let's go through some of these categories of these different things that... Um, that these athletes are using, so you're kind of aware of what's going on with the sugar, the pH, and the and the um, caffeine, and a lot of that. We talked about water. Most bottled waters are a pH of four, so what water people are drinking, um, athletes are drinking, is important. Um, it now we have water enhancers. How many of you have those patients where they're like, I don't like water, I don't want to drink water. Can I put such and such in the water? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, horrible, right? It creates this environment for erosion and dental caries. So this was on a flight just not very long ago, going to one of these seminars, by the way, and um, and they had in their little brochure on the flight some fancy advertisement for this blah, 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 fancy cocktail or whatever, and it was a night flight. I'm going late at night, right? You know, and it's like, okay, so that's interesting. So they so they give me this packet of grapefruit. This is the flavoring for this, this drink, right? You've got the soda or whatever your liquor is that they were putting in it, and you've got this packet. This is, you know, they don't have fresh limes or lemons on these flights anymore. Remember when you always got the fresh? Yeah, when was the last time you saw that? Maybe if you fly first class, right? Most of the time I'm not flying first class. <laughs> we're cheap dentists. We don't always fly first class. <laughs> anyway, so, so look at this. Crystallized grapefruit, citric acid. So I put this packet in this soda water, I swear to God, I could feel my teeth like just melting away. The nanohydroxyapatite crystals were breaking off in a rapid way. It was the most horrible feeling. I mean, it was just like caustic in my mouth, right? This is what these water enhancers are. Was, so these are some of the ones you see in the, in the grocery store. Um, this Mayo, I was doing the grocery store like three days ago before I came. There's a huge cardboard stand. And it's talking about how this is like the way you get your vitamins. You don't need to take a multivitamin anymore. You just put this mayo in your water. I was horrified. It's a pH of 2.5. I mean, you might as well drink some battery acid along the side, right? Um, this one has, has the caffeine in it. No sugars. But, I mean, this is, this is a scary pH when we're talking about these patients that are fragile. This was slightly better, 3.3, no sugar, no caffeine. Um, Crystal Light, our go-to, the one that everybody talks about as a flavor enhancer. Now it comes with caffeine. 
if you didn't know that. Um, it's 2.8. I mean, how many people are using this crystal lighter? They've got this in their desk drawers or all these things. I mean, it's, it, it, um, so then these hydration things. A um, couple years ago, I, uh, I got valley fever. So some of you from California probably are aware of, of valley fever, the fungus that gets in your lungs. It makes you hella sick. It's horrible. Well, nobody in Washington knows about this kind of diagnosis. So I was, I was sick for a long time. Um, and so you have, to start, you have to start doing some of these things that I was horrified to do but to, to get the electrolytes back because you're fevering so bad. But... Um, the, so some of these are just like again pH of 2.5 no sugar but a pH of 2.5 this was one that was recommended to me when I was really sick liquid IV you know this is going to help you reduce your fevers do all this and I'm looking at it sort of critically oh it's slightly better it's 3.95 um, pH and 11 grams of sugar uh, if these are healthy ooh, Pedialyte right Pedialyte will never make anything bad for your kids right Pedialyte sport 4.1, 14 grams of sugar. <laughs> I mean, you have to laugh, right? I mean, it's just, but we don't go oftentimes and go and buy these things and we're not really aware of what all this, this stuff is, right? Oh, so here's your, here's your classic Coca-Cola, right? 55 grams of sugar, 48 milligrams of caffeine, pH of 3.2, right? It's one of the better guys. <laughs> This was an interesting um, study where they, they looked at it, children and adolescents, and they said no association between 100% fruit juice and tooth erosion in dental caries. I don't know about in your practice, but when I've done caries or risk assessment, 100% juice was sometimes one of those dietary risk factors that was a big deal. So interesting that this is in the science, um, but I would beg to differ that anecdotally this is not. <laughs> Not true. So it's worth talking about. Uh, Tropicana, we've got some nice orange juice over here in the room. You know, pH of four. It's right up there with the bottled water. So, you know, you think you're doing better by grabbing a bottle of water. It's all the same. <laughs> 28 grams of sugar, though. I mean, 100% uh, juice, 28 grams of sugar, and they're saying it's not cariogenic in this. I, I find that a little interesting. But, oh, this one's a health food, right? I mean, come on, it's green juice. What's wrong with green juice? Three grams of sugar, pH of four. <laughs> I mean, it's a, I mean, it's kind of surprising and shocking, right? I mean, it's just, oh my goodness. Um, here's another green juice, pH of four, 20 grams of sugar. It's a little better than the green machine, but. <laughs> Palm, how many of these great, 100% juice, these great fancy advertisements that they put on TV for Palm? 3.3, 32 grams of sugar. Oh. All right, so let's go to some of these, these lovely sports drinks. Gatorade. Look at the first three ingredients. Sugar, <laughs> dextrose, and citric acid. I mean, this is why we have to have some conversations with our patients. Just read the labels. You don't need a doctor's degree to figure this out. <laughs> if it says sugar... And it says acid. <laughs> Probably isn't going to be too good. <laughs> um, 34 grams of sugar, pH of 3. Oh, my gosh. Powerade, <laughs> pH of 2.7. This is what you're putting under the sports guard. <laughs> what is this doing to our biofilm? <laughs> it's screaming at us, right? <laughs> Body armor, another big one, pH of 3.8, 28 grams of sugar. Celsius, my, my parents sometimes get tired when they're driving and they stop at Costco and they found this at Costco and they're telling me about this. Yeah, because it has this caffeine, right? It's massively in caffeine. And so I said, I'm like, by the way, your new favorite driving drink has a pH of 3.1. And this is a really interesting one that I, I didn't really think about at first, but my, my personal trainer, because I have a lot of um, kind of chronic pain from the autoimmune stuff that triggered from the valley fever. And so just a little bit of weightlifting will sometimes put me into pain for several days, but they're trying to rebuild my body after doing 
being sick for so long two years ago, and he's like, you need to start using BCAs, branched-chain amino acids, so it really helps with muscle recovery. It's big in the sports world. He says, yeah, you just mix the powder and, and you drink it in the water. <laughs> I said, yeah, so you're going to have a one-on-one -on -one version of my lecture, and we're going to talk about what advice you're going to give to your athletes when you're recommending this at a pH of 3.4, right? Um, Acclimate, another one, 4.6, slightly better in pH, 6 grams of sugar. Um, protein water, uh, 3.2. I mean, these pHs are really bad. Is this not surprising to you? I mean, it's like, we know this, right? But when you see so many in an order, it's really 125 milligrams of caffeine. What about the energy drinks? Does it not amaze you how the, the size of some of these now? It's, it's terrifying to me. Uh, Red Bull. Sponsor of all the big extreme sports things, right? 3.4, 120 grams of caffeine, 39 grams of sugar. <sighs> this is what our young people are drinking. This is what's being marketed and advertised to them. I mean, that's, that's a hard machine to push against, right? Good for Rob Lustig for going after them, but we need to join them, right? This is a, this is a big thing. Um, monsters, 54 grams of sugar, 160 milligrams of caffeine, 3.5 pH. Rockstar, pH of 3, 62 grams of sugar, 240 milligrams of, of caffeine. NOS, 3.4, 51 grams of sugar, 160 milligrams of caffeine. Ooh, Mountain Dew has an energy drink now. Did you know this? I mean, if it didn't get better, right? We, this was already our devil in our practices, right? It's Mountain Dew mouth goes right along with meth mouth. <laughs> Mountain Dew energy, pomegranate blue burst. Doesn't that just sound lovely? <laughs> pH of 3.1, only four grams of sugar, uh, 180 milligrams of caffeine. Oh my gosh, immune support and mental boost, it says right there in the bottle. <laughs> oh look, Starbucks is getting it a little bit better. We're at 6.6, .6, so we're right at that level that you know we might we might uh, destroy our root debt in here, right? 225 milligrams of caffeine, 30 grams of sugar, 210 calories. Woo, no wonder we're getting diabetic. Do any of you, are you, any of you guys familiar with energy gels? So this is a really interesting one, and we'll, we'll kind of work with this a little bit this afternoon, but your runners, people who are runners or cyclists, these are a real fan of those. Um, and so this is a huge one. Um, 5.3, 7 grams of sugar. Super greens. Again, the greens, right? 3.4. And this is a really interesting one that if you have those sports directors in your practice or whatever to pull this study out and talk about it. I've seen some ads um, like with some of the tennis players talking about this, but chocolate milk had a positive effect on strength development and should be considered an appropriate post-exercise recovery for adolescents. Hey, guess what? The pH is 6.9. Now we're talking, right? We can live with that, right? If you're trying to get those patients to move, you're not going to convince them to drink water, right? They believe they have to have something as a recovery drink. This is, a, this is a place to start. Much lower sugar, a much better pH, right? Muscle milk, chocolate milk. Um, two grams of sugar, 6.8. Core power, 6.7, 26 grams of sugar. The, I've started talking about this with a few of the people that are involved in sports in my practice, and most of them have no idea. These athletic directors and these coaches, they have, they have um, no idea. I don't know about you, but you get all those people that think kombucha is going to save everything with their gut, right? <laughs> it's really popular. In the health food section in my grocery store, there's a whole refrigerated thing full of these various types of kombucha. Nine grams of sugar, pH of 3.5. They add a lot of stuff to it to make it taste good. It's kind of like we were talking about those yogurts, right? What are they <laughs> adding to some of this, right? Uh, 13 grams of sugar, pH of 3.1. 12 
12 grams of sugar, pH of 3. That's a popular brand that I've seen. And then a lot of people like to grab a beer after they exercise, right? So what is beer? pH of 4, 13 grams of carbs. This is a popular brand of NA beers. We're starting to see a lot more NA beers come out again, a pH of 4.3. Total carbs is 16 grams. So how do we start to deal with this, right? What do we do? Um, a lot of the athletes want a recovery or they want the carb loading before they go. We talked about it. You've got to read the label. You've got to kind of know what's going on with some of these, these drinks. And you want to minimize that sugar load, right? Just like we talked about, getting some sugar with a meal is better than having it frequently throughout the day. So how do we, how do we deal with that, that carbohydrate loading? So <laughs> I love these mugs that were given to me by a colleague, Sip and Gulp. It's a great metaphor to use in our practices. I tell them, hey, if you need to have that Red Bull, you need that Gatorade, you need to do the goo or whatever it is, right? Get it down and then rinse your mouth with tap water. Um, and then wait 30 minutes before you brush. Back to the point that we were talking about earlier, right? Don't acid etch those teeth and then take that hydroxyapatite off. Um, so this is a really great, great way to um, do it. You can take those concepts, put it into a branded handout for your practice, make a little thing that goes up into your treatment operatories or whatever. It starts a conversation. People are really interested in this because they believe in these carb loadings or these muscle recovery things. And this is being so heavily marketed, both in school sports programs and our grocery stores and our sports stores and all this kind of stuff. Um, so read the label, try to make it one short, one short sugar load, sip, don't gulp. Um, and so by doing that, by getting it, allowing that saliva to recover, a lot of these athletes are young, young people, so we hope they have a better saliva to recover that. We can really, we can really reduce um, their carries risk. Kind of fun to look at all that, right? It's like um, interesting, and I think, I think putting it into the realm of just that sports, not just thinking about the sodas and all that kind of stuff, but what people are using is quote unquote health stuff. Yeah, I haven't dug in deep into those. I mean, there's there's amazing amounts of information and 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 stuff, right? But I'm in the in the context of what we're looking at here, we're trying to make it how do we distill it into the most simplified you know, way that we can implement this with our with our patients. But yeah, I think there's some really fascinating stuff when you start to look at the buffering of saliva. Most of my patient population don't have much saliva. <laughs> So I sort of take that out of the picture in a lot of, in a lot of the considerations in my day-to-day -day practice at least. But I think if you're dealing with a lot of the younger, younger kids and stuff in your practice, those are really, those are interesting things, at least for those of us who are geeky, geeky science readers. All right. Anything else there? That is it. So lunchtime, it's almost 12. We did a lot in three hours. I hope everybody's <laughs> holding out with me. So we'll take a lunch break for about 30 to 45 minutes or so. Um, let's call it let's call it 45 minutes, and um, and then we're going to come back and we're going to actually start talking a little more in depth about wellness coaching, and we're going to start putting it to practice. Um, I was hoping for a few more people in person to do this, but we're going to take who we have and we're going to demonstrate it for you and try to make it as fun and interesting um, and real world as possible. Uh, in the afternoon. So have a great lunch. Thank you so much.
Yeah. All right, to our virtual audience, come back to your computer screens. I know it's Friday afternoon, and it's beautiful, and it's so hard to do this, but I promise this is the, the more fun part. I intend, for those of you who are virtual, for this to always be an in-person workshop. So we're experimenting and modifying a little bit. So the part that I would normally have the group practicing and doing together we are, and the few of us that are here, going to live demonstrate it for you. Um, so I have some of the specific patient information for the very last part of today's program um, that is uploaded both on the REDS homepage. You'll see one that says patient one and patient two. And um, also the CARES risk assessment form that we've seen in the lecture. Um, there's a copy of that that's also um, there. It was also emailed to you. So take some time to make sure that you're accessing to that. Um, because when we do our practice coaching sessions with patients and doctor or hygienist, um, only the said patient is going to have access to that information of, of who they are as a patient. And so um, I'm not going to put it up on the screen, so not everybody here in my live audience can cheat. Um, but you online have access for that so that you could follow it and, 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 and start to make a little bit of sense of it. So as we're getting started here, let's make sure that um, you guys are finding that either in your email or on the Red's homepage. Um, this is the part that's really fun for me. I really have had a lot of fun with with coaching um, and I think it will feel, some of this will feel awkward and a little bit unnatural at first, but I hope you will start to slowly practice it. And it, it's my belief and hope that you will find this transformational in your practices because as somebody who grew up in dentistry and really struggled to love clinical, this was a huge game changer for me in, in finding a new, new love of, of dentistry for me. Um, so we talked about this morning a little bit of my journey through this with my father and with Dr. Cooch and one of the transformational moments was when Dr. Cooch was lecturing with Ferocia Knight. So Ferocia Knight is a coach. She has what is now called Coach Training World in Portland, Oregon. Um, but she is one of the foremost wellness coaches in the world, an amazing coach trainer. Um, a little comment just about coaching is that we see a lot of people calling themselves a coach, right? Of course, we know about this from sports coaches and all this kind of stuff. We know the value of a coach. I think that's very well accepted in our society. Um, but a lot of people, even in our dental world, are throwing around the word, word coach. Um, many of them have not taken any formal coaching training or not certified. And I'm not going to point fingers or do anything about that, but there is a very formalized training for wellness coaching, for life coaching, for business coaching of, of of coach and there is an international body that regulates coaching that it's not a mandated stuff but I think we're going to go that direction um, in terms of it if going to that so I think that's just something for you to be aware of in the general in the general coaching um, world um, but Ferocia is this amazing person we'll reference some of the things that she talked about um, coach training world if any of you are interested in coaching after today's session send me an email whatever we can talk about it um, both Kim and I went through her
her program and have tried to take what we learned from the general coaching world and, and start to apply it to what we do in our everyday dental practice. Because let's admit it, in dental school and dental hygiene school, they didn't really talk to us much about how to talk to patients, right? I was 20 years old when I started dental school. I was the youngest one in the class. And when we hit clinic, I felt like I had so little life experience that the most hard part of it was talking to the patient. They just looked at me and like, oh my God, are you young enough to drill on my teeth? <laughs> Uh, and so this was just an area that I always really, really struggled with for a long time early on in my career and in dental school. And uh, learning the various aspects of coaching and the many things that I learned in the coaching training was really transformational in my ability. I think it's super powerful for leadership. Um, again, my email will be up at the end. I have a little fun little handout about coaching for leaders, which I think is great for your um, dental practices if you're interested in that. So that's a little bit of the backstory of coaching so today we are going to talk about what wellness coaching kind of looks like and involves in your practice we're going to look at a whole bunch of cases so how do we start putting together the usual suspects that carries risk assessment for and the coaching conversation and how do we pull that together in your practice and we're going to practice the language so that's a little bit about what we're going to do at the end which we will try to demonstrate and involve those of you who are watching online if you can hang through friday afternoon with us um, or if you're watching this later. But my intention usually is this for to be a workshop where you practice it together. So I would encourage you to use those patient cases that I uploaded. Use the CARES Risk Assessment Form. Practice them as your teams in the practice. Talk about it um, based on kind of what we demonstrate today. So we're going to do just a little bit of quick review. I know we've done this all in a day. A lot of times I'm doing this at a convention where I have a different audience for this workshop than what I have in the morning. So I usually try to try to do a little bit review, but we're going back to this idea of not just treating the symptoms, trying to treat it as a disease, as a unique individual and human um, based on the science that we have. So the four P's that we involve with our caries risk management being predictive, preventive, personalized, and today, this afternoon, we're going to talk a lot about the participatory. And Going back to what we talk about is this definition of dental caries. I want to make sure that we're really kind of reviewing some of these key things to remind that it's a biofilm mediated, host modulated disease that breaks down the, the dental hard tissue. Um, this is a really fascinating book looking at humans, but again, talking about that we want to look for patterns, right? We want to look for those simple patterns, and so that's why we created this idea of the usual suspects so that you're always coming back and, and looking at those patterns. So a quick, quick review, um, saliva, 63%, diet, 55%, biofilm, 50%, about 9% of genetics in the population. What does it always come back to? pH. Kaiser so say it always comes back to the, to the pH. And so, Again, as we go through this afternoon, as you go back to your practices and you look at your patients every hour in your hygiene schedule, as you're meeting those new patients and trying to figure out the three words that need to be running through your mind, saliva, diet, biofilm, saliva, diet, biofilm. These are the three things that you wanna, wanna take note of. Even when you're not doing a, a formal caries risk assessment, having a conversation. Um, sometimes I've even had some great conversations when you're at an event that has nothing to do with dentistry, but they find out you're a dentist and they start talking to you about it. what's running through your head when you're watching them talk. It's looking at those, those, those things. So again, a quick review of what we talked about this morning, using a really simplified caries risk assessment that quickly gets us to these three categories. If we don't have any risk factors, it's going to be low risk, coded D0601 at least one risk factor we're at moderate risk d0602 and a high risk is when we have disease factors as well at d0603 so let's go back to those three things that we're going to look at saliva diet biofilm saliva we see this dry mouth with the shiny gums no salivary bubbles and you know that can be really classic and easy right those extreme those extreme cases but I remember as a college student having this older professor in one of my classes, and as he's talking, there was always bubbles, all these bubbles on the corner of his mouth. And I remember thinking as this young college student, that is so disgusting. Like, can he not, like, keep these bubbles in his mouth? 
It was long before I realized that that was also a classic sign of dry mouth, right? That really ropey, sticky, bubbly saliva that just, you can't even swallow it, right? It sticks in <laughs> those, 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 um, those places. So we know that many of those hypertension, diabetes, osteoporotic um, medications cause, cause the dry mouth, those ones that are not your skin, skin medications and, um, and many of these people, you know, are taking multiple medications um, or five or more. And the flow rate, again, that the critical flow rate is at 3.5 milliliters per minute, not always practical to um, assess those numbers, but that's sort of the benchmark where we start to see these effects of caries in periodontal health. Okay, so we dry mouth, the medications and the, and the what are we seeing visually in the mouth um, with, the, with the saliva or the lack thereof. Those are the two key things that you're going to look at under that saliva component. So we're really trying to break it down and say simplify. What are those things that we go to quickly and simply that are going to make the biggest, the biggest impact? Diet carries all the way through, right? Again, 25% of the global disease burden is back to that sugar. I guess I tucked away my sugar, my sugar bag, but how do we start to, to affect um, that sugar? And this is a really interesting one that just one item increase in sweet food consumption at age six months remains statistically significant for associated permanent molar caries. Right? It's the cute picture, right? Giving your baby the birthday cake. I mean, who doesn't want that for your Instagram or <laughs> whatever is going on? But this is really significant that, that affecting that environment that affects those taste gene expressions starts to introduce these neurological pathways of pleasure and habits, it starts young, right? I mean, little things really, um, really affect that and, and starting to have just those simple educational conversations with our young families and, and such, and even sometimes having it with the grandparents, right? I see a lot of those older ones in my practice, and early on when I saw a lot more young families, a lot of times they say, well, we have everything really good at home. But when they go to grandma's house and grandma takes care of them three days a week, they get all these kinds of things. And they're like, they never gave me that when I was young, but now they do it for my kid. You know, I mean, so starting to say, okay, we'll have grandma come in with their next cleaning so that we can talk to grandma about, about some of these things. Um, fascinating. So that cavities throughout the mouth, um, we definitely always want to start to look at that sugar, right? And the same when you see the bite wings and the only decay you see is those little proximal lesions, right? What are you thinking? Sugar sweetened beverages. <laughs> so biofilm, what's going on with the plaque on the teeth? Um, you know, are they, are they doing anything to intervene with that plaque on the teeth? We identified that we have a lot of bugs, right? It's not just strep mutans. There's a lot of bugs. They like to invite each other to the party. They like to produce lots of, lots of acid. And now we're beginning to learn that candida is this big player and how are we going to start to intervene with that and, and play with that. And we talked about a little bit of this this morning, but the sodium hypochlorite rinse is super effective with candida, even with your denture patients. I had a primary care physician call me a while back and she says, I can't get this thrush cleaned up in the patient. And it's going, okay, well, does the patient have teeth or do they have dentures? Oh, they have dentures. Okay, they got to bleach their dentures, right? You're just continuing to seed it in the mouth because, oh my God, I never even thought of that, right? So we can play an important role. And we'll, we'll see where it goes in terms of what tests we develop for being able to evaluate, but knowing that candida is a player. And again, that low toothbrushing frequency, adding at least one sugar sweetened beverage a day sort of has that reverse effect with the, with the caries um, scores of doubling or at least 50%. So is there visible plaque? What's going on with that? And can we use one of the biometric tests to start, of, start give us an idea of what's going on with the biofilm? And hopefully they will continue to get better and better, those, those biometric tests. And what are some of those other things? How do we affect this in healthcare? You know, we do have this availability to play this small role in starting to affect their behavior. We have to, affect, we have to acknowledge that genetics is a big part of our, our outcomes as well. A couple of interesting other factors to throw in there. Um, 
as well that we can start to think of. Um, we mentioned earlier a little bit of gastric reflux can be a, a big player that we're seeing more and more of in, in our society. Um, and here's a couple of interesting studies that I, I thought were fun. Um, prenatal and partner smoking appear associated with a greater offspring carries experience. Um, I don't know that we know a, a ton about this in terms of genetic versus environmental, but kind of an interesting thing from a 2020 study, right? We don't really think about, obviously we always want to talk about smoking cessation, right, in dentistry, but do we never really played with that as a correlative for, for that. And then what about all this vaping in young people, right? All these things, we don't even know what's in this stuff. These, these e-liquids and, and all this stuff, um, but definitely a huge potential for cariogenic risk. With that, I'm guessing that they probably have some citric acid in some of those because they want them to be on the, on the shelf for a long time. And then all these flavors and all these interesting things, I think um, we're starting to see some shift in this. This was 20, 2018, so we've had five years. You know, some of these lawsuits and some of these various things, I think we're starting to see a little shift away from some of this, but it was kind of a big deal um, for a while. Okay, so we have our pattern. We want to make it simple, right? It's live a diet biofilm. We want to go from point A. What, what is that per, that entity that's causing those cavities? Um, and our treatment strategy of saliva, we're going to try to hydrate and neutralize and stimulate the saliva um, using lozenges or, or anything that we know will support that remineralization with diet. You know, what's going on with what that? Are we going to limit the sweets? Are we going to limit the sugar? Are we going to limit the snacking? Are we going to employ an antimicrobial if we know that there's something serious going on with that? Or are we going to work with the oral hygiene in terms of mechanical removal? And the genetic factor that we just know we have to support generalized wellness and, and minimize um, dropping into that acidic pH. Okay, so let's get into some of the coaching now that we've kind of gone back and reviewed. A little bit of that, tried to re-stimulate our brain after all the, the food that we had for lunch. <laughs> um, so how do we start to work through some of this coaching language and that? Um, again, our protocol with low risk, we want to educate us on those risks. Um, we want to make them aware of that saliva diet biofilm sort of thing so that they're giving us that feedback um, on a regular basis. On the moderate risk, we want to personalize it. How do we make this relevant to their life? And on the high risk, right, we got to really get down to it, right? Something's got to change. How, you know, is there a way that we can start to work through that? And it's going to feel hard, right, because there's probably a lot of risk factors we have to do. Um, so I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about a food journal, because this morning I referenced that one study where they did a food journal. This is a little adjunct to um, the Carrie's risk assessment that I use on a lot of cases in my practice and have found it really helpful from two points. One, it's just hard in a fast conversation in the office to try to remember all those things that people might be eating or drinking that are acid or, or cariogenic, right? And second, we want this to be participatory. Even we don't even recognize our own habits and behaviors, right, until you start tracking it and then you're like, oh crap, I didn't realize I was doing that, <laughs> you know? And so, um, so I like to, to have certain patients keep a food journal when we're working through a couple of visits of wellness coaching. And I just have them write down everything they consume, everything that goes in the mouth, food and drink, right? Um, and I want them to do it at least for five to seven days. And I like to include at least one weekend day because oftentimes our lifestyle shifts between school days and work days or what are non-work weekend days. So I like to include that. And then you just start to, you start to pick out these visual patterns pretty carefully and the patient really participates in the, in the process. This one's really interesting. This is a young high school girl who was really great about keeping a very detailed food journal um, in which we identified a whole bunch of different things in that. And um, mom was very insulted about this. She comes in and she says, I told my daughter not to turn in that food journal because that just makes me look like a horrible cook. And I do not, I am not that bad. I am so much better of a mom and cook than that at home. And I said, I, I, we're not reflecting anything on this. We're simply trying to find out 
why, even though we try to stay away from numbers, your daughter has 17 new pr potential lesions in her mouth, right? Mom was so insulted when she come, comes in to talk about what's going on with this. And this is one of those classic things that I learned in my coaching training, is that sometimes you're working with a minor, right, a young person, and it's not always that patient that needs coaching. Sometimes it's the person who goes to the grocery store who needs the coaching. <laughs> So slowly, incidentally, before we've even, you know, gone on to decide all these remineralization things, you know, we've been working with this young girl. Mom comes in because she has a cavity that we need to, to fill. One of those CEJ cavities, right, where you know you've got to get to them really quickly because they're going to grow. And so I took the opportunity to kind of start asking some open-ended questions and, and probing. And throwing. we're starting to make some progress about where we're going to go with this. But I... I I wanted to bring this up for two reasons. One is I just think a food journal is a really great tool because it sometimes just gives you information that you're just not going to pick up by sometimes always asking those questions, especially if you're just struggling to find out. You're pretty sure sugar or snacking is involved, but you're really struggling to get them to answer and figure out what it is, and that food journal will do it. And I found most patients are pretty receptive to it. The other thing with the food journal is with my retired patients, I have found that Either they were a snacker at work, or now they're a snacker in retirement. And it's not always consistent. It's not a consistent habit. And so sometimes if they had a certain desk job or something, right, there's snacks in the drawer. So you're, you're kind of like, you know, or they're putting the water enhancers in their water, or they're sipping the drink that's on their desk, right? I have found that there's a fair number of men who were not snackers when they are at work, and now, every time they go through the house to go to the garage or their shop to work on something, they grab a snack as they pass through the kitchen. And all of a sudden, they've been pretty healthy. And about a year or two into retirement, you're going, where are all these carious lesions coming from? And so starting to think about what are some of those potential lifestyle risks or actual lifestyle risks that are changing with that retirement. Um, and that's again where they maybe they were low risk, they've been really healthy. You start to educate about these things. You know how many patients come in and they say, gee doc, can you look at everything because I'm about to retire in a year and I'm gonna lose my insurance benefits and so I retire. These are really great opportunities to redo your carrier's risk assessment, start to talk about what, how is their lifestyle gonna potentially change in retirement. So food journal can be a really helpful, helpful thing with that. And then who are you coaching? <laughs> so that can be, uh, things. So wellness coaching is really helping us, helping the patient understand their risks and where some of their issues might be coming from and empowering them to, to do something about it. So let's dig into that. This is one of my favorite visuals for coaching. I just think that's such a powerful picture. And as we know with human behaviors, right, we're here and we're here and some years are good, some weeks are good, some months are bad and we're, we're all over, right? It's like a feather in the breeze, right? We're up and we're down and we're off this direction and then we're off that direction, right? And as a coach, our job is simply to walk with that journey with that patient and be there to support, right? We're just doing this. We're not in control, it's their teeth, it's their life, it's their decisions, it's their lifestyle. We're just there to, to, to be there of that support and understanding that they're going to be here, there, all over, and this is just human behavior, right? We want to solve problems. We're doctors, right? We want to get it right. We want to do this. We want to get to the result. That's not what this is about. And I think this is just a, a really powerful visual to keep in your mind as you start to shift your thinking as to how you can interact with your patients as a coach. Does that make sense? Is that kind of real? So one of the things that Ferocia worked with us in my coaching program and that was a huge struggle is I go in there, right? I'm the type A doctor, right? Like, oh, come on. You know, this is going to be easy. This is coaching, right? We're not talking biochemistry here. Oh, my gosh. It was so hard because we would be doing these practice coaching things in the class, and she would be observing us, and she would always be like, Julie? You're five steps ahead of your client. You're problem solving again. You already know the answer. 
you've already decided, you've already judged them, this is not coaching. It was so hard, right? I'm like, this is what they trained me to do. This is, this is what I had to do to get my DDS degree, right? To be, <laughs> for, you know, to, you've got to solve the problem. And there's a place for that, right? We have patients that are in pain, patients that have critical infections. They are coming to us sometimes to problem solve and to diagnose and to prescribe. But that is not all that we do. Sometimes we have to educate and we have to inform. They don't know what the solutions are. They don't know some of these things that are causing their disease processes. And then we have to coach to empower and support the transformation, to get to that change, to have them personalize it, to digest it, to want them to do that. And so one of the things that Ferocia taught me is to think about it as what hat you're wearing. And I have found this to be a really powerful tool in my practice, right? How many times are we sitting there on our stool, right, with the patient, having that conversation? And we're, we're zooming in and out of doctor mode, educator, teacher mode, and coach mode all the time. But if you, if you start to visualize in your mind as you're having this conversation, which, which hat you're wearing at that moment in time, you will start to have such more profound and effective conversation. Because there are moments. We need to say, you broke your tooth, you have this infection, here's solution A or B. You know, there are other times that we need to talk about what's in those sports drinks, you know, what's the pH of that, you know, have we looked at this, we need to educate. And then there's those times that we need to hand them and say, okay, here's what we found. What are you going to do? What's your plan? How can I, can I help you? And, we're, and we're, all this is part of one conversation. And I just remember feeling so overwhelmed sometimes, right? How do, I, how, how do I do between that? And this, this idea of which hat you're wearing has been a really profound thing. So many times when I'm sitting in the operatory having this conversation, in my mind it's like, okay, I'm teaching right now. Right now I'm being the doctor. Here I'm just being, being the coach. And I found that to be very, very profound for the, for the practical conversations that I have. So again, does it really take 21 days to change a habit? No, we're crazy humans. We're inconsistent. We like to slack off, right? No, it's 66 to 250 days if we are even consistent in repeating it, right? Um, and those are, those are really, really hard things. Um, James Clear, I don't know if you've read Atomic Habits, fabulous book. James Clear writes a very short weekly newsletter that comes in your email that is just the most fabulous thing. I look forward to every Thursday when it comes into my email, his little, his little email. So if you want a little bit of inspiration in your, um, in your email, um, let it know. But he talks about just trying to make 1% improvement a day, and it will get 37 times over a year. Um, so we're humans, right? It's challenging to have change. It takes lots of time. We're here, they're all over there. We're like the puppy learning to eat the food out of the bowl. We make a big mess. We kick it around. We, ro we roll in it a little, you know. We need that support and that positive encouragement. All of us, all of us do because it's an up and down, up and down journey. And this is just a really fun, fascinating study to think about it. And one of the things that I will ask you as the audience is, do you remember when you learned to brush your teeth? Do you remember anybody teaching you to brush your teeth? As long as you can remember, it's been habitual, right? You just walk into the bathroom, brush your teeth. It's the same that we were talking about. Do you rinse before you brush? Do you drink water after you brush? Why are we doing these things that have nothing to do with what makes sense for what, what's good for our teeth, right? So this study talks about the fact that once we've developed this habit, it's even harder to change it, right? We literally have to sort of disrupt the whole thing to try to make a change. And I've played with this ever since I learned that study. It is still so hard for me to not want to take my toothbrush and slurp the water when I'm done brushing because I've done it for so long, right? How do we think about disrupting those habits? So this is another one of those really interesting things about um, human behavior that we need to talk about. We just think, oh, come on, guys, to our patients. Like, this makes sense to our scientific mind. We've been taught this. Why can't you do it? Well, because who knows what crazy habit they were taught when they're parents taught them to brush their teeth, right? Like, it might have had nothing to do with logical. It was like, put the screaming kid on the countertop and hand him the toothbrush. Let's get this done. You know what I mean? There, there wasn't a whole lot of logical stuff going on at that point in time, right? And so how do we try to 
to sort of disrupt this habitual process if we want to we want to um, change some of these these habits. And again, the orthodontic study of how do we man well, how do we use technology that we have that, the, that these phones are ubiquitously on our bodies all the time that can potentially give us some reminder or or initiative to do that. And again, sugar, right? It comes back to sugar is the big one. It's such a hard thing to change. Change those habits. We can change eating better fruits and vegetables. We can quit drinking so much wine. But changing things with sugar is tough um, in our dental office. So one of the other things that we talk about in the, in the coaching world um, and that a coach that helps me with writing has talked about is this idea of pleasure bundling. So how do we combine something that we want to do all the time, that we're always looking forward to doing, to start to interact with these, with these habits? Um, desire initiates and pleasure, pleasure sustains. So um, I've talked about it with a lot of those patients that are starting to get more spaces between their teeth, and we want them to start using interproximal brushes or sometimes a little flosser or whatever. And I'll say, God, nobody wants to stand in front of the mirror, wrapping string around their finger, spitting stuff on the mirror, trying to watch themselves awkwardly make faces to floss, right? There is no pleasure in that whatsoever, right? But if you sit and do it in front of the TV when you watch whatever show is your favorite show, well, it's easy, right? Because you're engaged in the show. You're not thinking about how stupid your face looks in the mirror because you're trying to floss the way your dental hygienist told you to, right? So with any of those habits, how can we bundle it with something that, that we enjoy, whether it's doing them together or that, okay, I know I like to do this, so when I do this, then I get to do this. And, and you start to start to play these, these games with each other. So having those conversations with your patients to say, okay, what are some of those things that you look forward to every single day? And how can you start to bundle it with some of these things that we're trying to, trying to implement um, in that? Um, when we introduce something new to our patients, it's kind of scary, right? We have our agenda. We come in there, right? We want our patients to be healthy. We don't want you to have any cavities. We want you to brush and floss exactly the way that we told you to. We have our agenda, right? And our patients, like, oh, my God, I got a teenager who's throwing a fit every day. My car just died. My spouse is mad at me. My boss wants to fire me. Like, they are not interested in that we just told them to put two centimeters of toothpaste on their toothbrush and that they need to quit eating sugar, you know. So we have these things that are, that are pushing against each other. And there's a lot of change and fear that go together in that. And so we have to sort of set, set down and say, okay, what is our box and what is the patient's box here? One of the things that Ferocia teaches in the coaching training a lot is, is this human behavior of 30% of people will just say no. Don't worry about it. As you start to implement this in your practice, at least 30% of the people will just say, nope, not interested. Okay, you still know how to scale their teeth. You can still drill and fill their cavities, do that crown. We know how to do this. We've done it for years, right? No big deal. 30% will say no. 3% will be ready for change. They'll see the big picture. Thanks, doc. That's awesome. Let's go. What do I got to do, right? It's the other 67%. They need to be educated over time. Figure out what are the things that are important to them. What are those drivers in their life? What are their goals? What are their values? And then start to educate and personalize those things around that. And those are the ones that over time you will very, very slowly um, start, to, start to do that. We were talking not that long ago at our hygiene meeting about a patient of mine that was one of the first patients I saw early on in practice. He's been a patient for almost 20 years and um, drank a ton of Coke. And at first it's like, yeah, 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 whatever. Like, I like my Coke. I'm going to drink my Coke all day. Ain't nothing you're going to say that's going to make a difference. Okay. But he had cavities every time, right? And we just sort of started kept talking about these conversations and this and that, you start educating him about, well, the frequency matters and, you know, maybe you can do this or whatever. I don't know when the last time he has a cavity was. It's been probably two or three years. And he has a Coke with breakfast and he has a Coke with lunch. He doesn't drink coffee. Um, so he has a Coke with breakfast and a Coke with lunch. Great. It took us 15 years to get there. But he's there. And he still has his teeth. We've only lost one tooth in the process. That was very early on. He still has his teeth. He's still doing great. He totally buys into it now. 
one of our best advocates. You know, and it's just, it's that 67%, right? We've just got it. Ferocious says, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. But you can feed him salty peanuts. <laughs> so what are some of their objections? I can't afford it. My insurance doesn't cover it. I don't have time. Well, I'll think about it. Is it going to hurt? I'm scared. I'm going to lose my teeth anyway. I got this big family event coming up. Right? They, we've heard them all. You know these. You can add to the list. We could put like 50 of them up here, right? It's a lot of this fear, right? And we have our objections. You know, some, how, about, how many of some of those patients do you just not have the conversation with because they're always cranky when they come to the dental office? Or everything is dramatic. I can't believe you're telling me I should stop drinking flavored water. Like, I'm going to die. Right? We have those. We struggle to always want to treat everybody equally and have these conversations because sometimes in our day we just don't want to deal with that either, right? We're humans. How many times have we heard this? I hate the dentist. So what makes you uncomfortable? We don't have to leave it at that. Sometimes it's something really silly that we can fix really easily. You know, what can, what can we do to change that? How can we make it better? What would make you like going to the dentist a little bit more, right? We can start to use open-ended questions because sometimes we just go, oh, God, I can't believe I'm hearing this at 8 o'clock in the morning again, right? So focus on some of these benefits. How would it feel if every time you came to your hygiene appointment, you were pretty darn confident you didn't have any cavities? A lot of patients can't even imagine that. But it's a reality with what we're talking about with this, right? What would you like your smile to look like if you could do anything? When we get our patients healthy and confident using this carries risk assessment, they come in wanting cosmetic dentistry. They want to do those extra things because they were scared before because they were negative about it. Well, it's like my teeth always hurt or I'm always getting cavities. I don't want to spend money on those nice crowns to get rid of this ugly tooth because it's just going to rot anyway. I always get cavities. I got them from my mom, you know, whatever. How would it change your life if you did this? You know, I mean, be prepared that sometimes if you ask these questions, you might get more than you wished for. They might cry. It might get a little emotional. And as doctors, that kind of makes us uncomfortable, right? We don't like having those emotional conversations. We want to get through a day where our patients didn't cry. But as I've worked through this coaching stuff and got through some of my discomfort of having these emotional conversations, I took my problem-solving hat off. It's almost become a compliment when a patient cries because you know you hit something that matters, something that's powerful in their life, something that's going to drive something meaningful for their future. But it's, it's going to be uncomfortable. Especially for men. <laughs> you really hate it when we cry. <laughs> what are people driven by, right? Money, relationships, health, and identity. They want to be in charge. They don't want us to say, you got this and this and this, and you have to do this and this and this, right? Immediately you're like, oh, I don't Why does anybody tell me what to do? I don't want to do that. People want to be in charge of their life and their decisions. And when we start practicing this coaching language and carries risk assessments in this, they can be. And we can be okay with it. It feels uncomfortable at first, but you'll find that you just discover this whole new level of freedom. Your patients love it, and you will love it so much more because you have this freedom. You don't have to own their outcomes, right? It's their teeth. It's their decisions. You're just there to empower, right? You're just the hands under the feather. 
So how do we make it more personalized by starting to discover these things, right? Maybe they're going to get a better job. Maybe they're going to have the confidence to go apply for a promotion or a better job that they didn't before. Everybody wants to look younger, right? Maybe they'll have a better relationship with their family or their spouse or their kids. Maybe they're going to eat without pain and sensitivity or worrying that they're going to break a tooth. Peace of mind and confidence and pride, right? How many different decisions do we make and how does our behavior change when we feel confident? So starting to put some of these things into the, this perspective of benefit for them and asking them those questions. So we talked about some of these. Uh, what, are the, what are the trouble with these yes or no questions? What are the often times that we say, what's the classic thing you walk into the recare appointment? Had any pain in your teeth lately? How's everything? You know, I mean, we just ask these silly questions. We set them up for silly things, right? Any problems with your teeth? Are you flossing these days like I told you to? Do your gums bleed? Are you tired of me asking you these stupid questions? <laughs> we do it, right? So the what, how, and tell that we talked about this morning. What would you like to focus on today? How has this affected your life? Tell me more about that that's interesting. Allowing them to be in that driver to tell you what's important to them. What would you like to focus on today? How can I help you? Have you ever walked into that? I mean, we walk into the retail stores, right? What's the first question they ask? How can I help you? Have you ever walked into your operatory and said that just out of the blue? People don't even know what to answer it. It's so unexpected from a doctor. That's interesting. Tell me more about that. Such an easy one. Just whatever they say. Oh, that's interesting. Tell me more about that. And they'll continue to tell you these things that end up being incredible clues. And then after they've told you something, anything else? How many times even in a toothache, right? When we're in our problem solving hat and they go, okay, well, this and this and this and this and this. And then you go, anything else? And all of a sudden they give you that piece that you really needed to know, right? So, so really staying neutral, these are one of these things that we talk about in, in coaching training of how do we continue to evaluate our language to be more neutral. We're in this politically correct culture, you know, oh, you said this and it hurt my feelings or I don't like this. But it's just looking at it and just saying, can we say things in a way that's just simply more neutral? So instead of you have 17 cavities, I found that you have three risk factors that are contributing to your cavities. That opens the conversation, right? It's not all of a sudden like, I can't believe my dentist told me I had 17 cavities. Well, I'm worried. This has been a really powerful one for me in my practice. Patients, when you take this personal investment into that and you just say, you know, I'm looking at your x-rays and I'm really worried. They start to listen. Why is my doctor taking a personal interest in worrying about me, right? If, or your hygienist, you know, it's like, what? You're seeing these things. You're not telling them you have. You're just simply saying, I'm worried. And then, why are you worried? You know, what's going on? Right? They're listening in that moment in time. Or the trend is changing. You know, if they've been really healthy, all of a sudden you're starting to see these hints. You know, you can start to say, I'm seeing this trend. Or you've done your perio charting. You say, I'm seeing this trend that I'm concerned about. And then you can sort of let them ask you and, and let them then take over the driver's seat. From there, so in terms of the carries risk assessment, some of the things that we'll practice here is I have found these risk factors that are contributing to your cavities. Which one do you want to work on first? Right? You already know which one you want them to work on first. But you're letting them do it. Because if they've decided which one they're going to work on first and they have then made their plan, they're much more likely to follow through and do that. And then you just simply accept it. You might not love it, you might not agree with it, you might suggest a couple modifications, but you're going to say, what support do you want from me? How can I support you to do this? So again, what hat are you wearing? Are you in the doctor problem solving mode? Are you in the teacher educating mode? Are you in that coach? I'm just supporting, I'm empowering mode. And kind of knowing where you are, what hat you're wearing throughout that conversation will make you much more aware and conscious of those words. Just like when we don't remember what, when we learned how to brush our teeth, right? 
you have these phrases you say in a dental office every day, but do you remember when you started saying them? <laughs> Like, it becomes habitual, right? Because we say this all day, every time. Sometimes we need that disruption so that we can start to hear ourselves and become a little bit more empowering and neutral. So we're going to start building this into how we do it in cases and this. We want to look for those risk factors, right? I'm going to keep coming back to this. Saliva, diet, biofilm. If you only remember three words that I told you today, <laughs> it's saliva, diet, biofilm. This is what we're going to what we're going to look for. Um, so here is our first patient case. 44-year-old female. Um, good blood pressure, good pulse, takes two medications, atenolol and Lasix, has extreme dental fear, is a recovering alcoholic. Here's her x-rays. And here's her carries risk assessment. So just to review, here's the basic demographic information we have on Darcy. Here's her radiographs. And excuse me, here is her carries risk assessment. What risk factors do you see? Medications. Saliva, right? What information do you need? What open-ended questions do you want to ask? Yeah, you might even ask a little bit as if she's a recovering alcoholic. Figure out where she started from or where she is, right? So here's a little bit more information. We have all the suspects, right? We've got saliva. Um, she circled um, diet, and we know we have got biofilm. We've got hypertension medications. Huge category, right? We see these all the time for dry mouth. Oh, so, so we found out what? She sips coffee with cream and sugar. Not so great oral hygiene. Carry screen was up there, but not extreme, because 9,999 is the highest. So what risk factor do we put her in? Right, definitely the high risk, because we've got all those, those disease indicators. So what would you do for this patient? She's high risk. How often would you like to see her? Probably for some fluoride varnish if she's open to that. You definitely want to try to add those remineralization agents, right? pH, xylitol. Mm-hmm. Pro 5000. And we, when we really want to dig into some of that coaching, right? What's, what's going on? What were those? What are we going to coach? Mm -hmm. So what would you say first? I found these risk factors, right? We have high plaque. We have a sugar, acidity, frequency, right? So behavioral coaching of home care, potentially some dietary. And what would you say? And what do you want to work on first? How can I support you? What is your... What is your plan? Does it start to kind of come together? It feels awkward at first, right, to not, to not go there. But um, um, 
What would you What would you start to? Okay, she says. Okay, I understand. I have my coffee every day. When you, you know, how are you going to educate her to help her with the plan? <laughs> yeah. Start to ask about her work environment, what her hours are, why does she feel like she needs coffee all day long, you know. You know, and then sometimes you can just say, do you think there's any way you can drink your coffee faster? What would that look like? You know, well, I think I could just have it in my car and then when I get to the office, I could rinse my mouth and go till morning break. You know, you start to, you start to get really creative with these little, little things, but it feels a little bit awkward to start to probe those questions at first. Does that start to make a little bit of sense? Okay, here is a, another patient case, 64-year-old female, good blood pressure, no medications, no health issues. Pretty nice photo. Yeah, you see some saliva, right? But those of us that are keen on looking at this, we start to look at it a little bit, right? Yeah. You can see that she's had a little bit of dentistry. Here's her x-rays. So she's definitely had a fair bit of dentistry. Here's her Carrie's risk assessment with one risk factor that she snacks daily between meals. Mmm. <laughs> I found one risk factor that you noted about snacking. Tell me more about that. That's interesting. <laughs> right? So we identified that snacking is a risk factor, and you're curious what it is. What, what might be going on with this, this risk factor? So we talked about that. That's interesting. Tell me more about that, right? Diet. So she snacks on dark chocolate frequently. Her carry screen was below 1,500, so that's, that's pretty good. So what category are we going to put her in? No, but you're, so she still has one risk factor, so it would technically be moderate, but, you know, we're not going to find line risk. Um, this one, on this history that circled no for his decay history, but that would be an arguable thing, right, because depending on how long ago some of that dentistry was done or why, you know, there was quite a bit of dentistry in those, in those x-rays. Um, so we've, w several of us have combined these patient cases, so this is not mine particularly. But because it's one risk factor, we would tend to put that in the moderate category um, because we want to, we want to make sure that we're, we're looking at what the future, future could be. That balance can be very fragile. So what would you do for her? See if you can personalize what's going on with the snacking. Offer her some of the supportive products to help make sure that we're going to stay in that, that good balance. So six-month fluoride varnish if she's open to it. Definitely using the pH xylitol, Nano HA, and Pro 5000, and then talking about if there's any way we can modify that dietary risk factor. So how would you approach this? What would you say? How would you, how would you start to address this one risk factor that we have? I found yeah, I found snacking. <laughs> how would you like to address this? What's your plan? I, I think this is a fun one because I think that I would ask, so where do you keep your dark chocolate? Tell me where you keep your dark chocolate. So you start to figure out where, you know. Dr. Cooch always likes to joke that his wife loves chocolate so much that they have chocolate in every room in the house. <laughs> but I just, it's an interesting thing, right? Like what kind of work environment does she has? Is she home? Like where is, where is this chocolate? You know, so you can start to. Then talk about what are the habits. Can you pleasure bundle it differently? Can you move it so it's not such an attractive, attractive temptation of, of sorts, right? Um, 
So what would you like to work on first? It could be she's just going to say, don't touch my chocolate, right? And you, we've only got one risk factor. Maybe then you just say, hey, let's, let's really work on supporting this so that this might not be potentially damaging. But if something changes and another risk factor comes in, right, your doctor prescribes a medication, then this could really start to become a concerning problem. So you're, so you're educating them to alert you. You're trying to be really neutral, just like our patient that drinks the Coca-Cola all the time. It might take a few years before all of a sudden something else changes in their life and they go, oh, I'm really ready to, to shift. There's a new motivation there. Any questions on that? Make sense? Okay. This is one that I just saw recently and I, and I added it to the lecture. So this is that classic case of comes to the dentist, Doc, I'm retiring soon. I just want to get my teeth checked before I lose my insurance. Uh, great time to renew that carries risk assessment and start to talk about that. Um, she just had been to the doctor and she had just started a blood pressure medication, never been on any prescription medications in her life. Um, she told me, I've only ever had four cavities, two each in each of my two pregnancies, which was a long time ago. She was retiring. Um, interesting. Here's her radiographs. Yeah, indeed, she's pretty close, right? Five restorations. Here's her carries risk assessment. One medication, she snacks between meals, and she did have a Chi carry screen result. So we have all three, all three risk factor categories of saliva diet biofilm there. And so we're going to need to figure out a little bit more about those, right? Um, what are we going to ask, you know? Tell me about what's going on that, that your doctor decided to add this blood pressure medication, you know? What do you like to snack on? Tell me about that. Um, in her case, she had beautiful oral hygiene. She does a very good job. So that was more educating about the biofilm. So we're definitely worried. Yeah, look at that. Surprising, right? Perfect oral hygiene, only ever four, four cavities. But look at that. Look at the carry screen. It's super high. We have a ton of acid-loving bacteria in there. Um, yeah. My immediate reaction was acid reflux. What's causing so many acid-loving bacteria? Why is everything so acidically driven there? And why did she suddenly tip out of balance only in her pregnancies? Well, you know, acid reflux worsening dramatically during pregnancies is a huge, huge factor. Um, and so that was my, you know, no way to prove it. That was, that was my suspicion on that because she hadn't been on any medications before. Um, so I put her in the high risk category because of that, that interesting um, tweaky decay history of that being in there. And because her carry screen was so high um, and the snacking was in between meals and she only snacked on nuts, which we know is one of the low cariogenic runs, right? Nuts and cheese. If you have somebody who's snacking, if you can start to move them towards that category of nuts and cheese. So I didn't feel her occasionally having some nuts because her blood sugar was dropping in her desk and she was trying to finish teaching or whatever she was doing at the university. I, I, didn't, I didn't really feel like that was a huge, huge, huge factor in that. But it turned into a really other interesting oral systemic conversation because I started talking to her about these pregnancies and what was going on in these pregnancies and how did the pregnancies go. Um, she wasn't vomiting a lot. You know, that was the other one you want to, you look at morning sickness. But then she started telling me how she'd had a couple of miscarriages. Well, I'd just been sitting in a lecture with Dr. Lodog who talked about that there's a huge correlation between miscarriages in women and future cardiovascular events. 
So she just went on a blood pressure medication. So out of my simple Carrie's risk assessment, I was able to go on and have this really valuable oral systemic conversation about what's going on at a cardiovascular level because she's got these risk factors that are, that are leading. So we don't, it, you know, again, what are those systemic effects? What are these linkages that, that, that we have um, going on? This one's also really interesting from a coaching perspective um, because, of course, I was super worried about the carry screen, right? We definitely want to think about an antimicrobial for her because we're probably not going to contain whatever this acidity that's, that's probably more systemic that, that's triggering. Um, you know, when we say, okay, the balance must be fragile because all of a sudden she tipped this balance in pregnancy, right? And um, so we started talking about some of this and talking about what she might plan, and it just became obvious that she was so overwhelmed with trying to transition to the next person who was taking her job and retire and finish up her career and all this stuff. She just didn't, she just couldn't think about it. It was just not a, not a priority to her. And so um, I said to her, I said, I think you have a really good understanding of this and you've been really interested in this, but does just this feel overwhelming to you right now because you're getting ready to try And she said, totally. I said, do you want to revisit some of these strategies in six months after you've retired and kind of settled into that? Yeah, I'd really like to do that. So again, just by keeping it open-ended and, and sort of being at that eye-to-eye -eye level with your patient, you know, is helpful into, into having that coaching conversation. So, yes, do we have some questions? Yes, actually. Um, how do you coach a patient since you're the doc telling me what to do? Well, they gave you permission, right? So how do you coach a patient that says, Doc, uh, you're, you know, you're the expert. Tell me what to do. You're going to put your education hat on, right? And... Um, and you're going to start making those recommendations. And then I would, I would follow up and say, how do you feel about these recommendations? You know, tell me about how you might implement these into your daily routine. Let's talk about that. Um, so still opening up some of those open-ended conversations um, to that. But I think absolutely sometimes asking our patients permission to educate them, you know, um, to say, hey, can I share? with you some strategies about how we can better support your teeth when you want to talk about fluoride and nanohydroxyapatite and pH balance products. Um, but when they've given you permission to tell me what to do, take it away, right? You've got their permission. There are also pediatric instructions that we kind of uh, formulate. We keep them sometimes at the low risk, moderate risk, mm -hmm. high risk. And once we do the assessment, we, they're pretty good at being structured. And we review it with them. Yeah. We go point by point. Yeah. And, you know, see what they come up with. And when they start asking, <clears throat> they become interactive, then you know you've got something really in place. Right. Having printed material to take home is, yeah. you know, I think, important. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I think that that, that can be um, very helpful, and I think it's great if you kind of tailor them to what works with your program and what, what you're comfortable in and supporting um, with that. Um, so a great question from our virtual, virtual audience. So I found these risk factors. Which one are you, would you like to work on? What is your plan? How can I support you? You know, these are sort of those follow-ups that we're going to keep that we're going to keep hitting on there. Um, and in this case, you know, we just chose to table it for a little while because sometimes patients are just not in a point in their life where they doing this. They get it, but they're not. They're not. They're not there yet. Okay, last one. Forty-six-year-old male, infrequent dental visits. Lovely picture of some tooth decay there. When you see a picture like that, what do you think? Sugar. <laughs> Beverages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, SDF is in the, in the photos. So here's our radiographs. Lots of history of dentistry for sure. And here's our Carrie's risk assessment. So what do we see there? What risk factors do we see? Snacking and plaque, right? <laughs> and so what information do you need about that? <laughs> Tell me about how you feel about brushing your teeth. I hate it. <laughs> I don't even own a toothbrush. So our usual suspects, diet and biofilm. Ooh. What's the culprit? Who done it? Mountain Dew. Yep. 
We have all the disease indicators. So what category do we put them in? High, High risk. And what would you do for this patient? <laughs> Everything plus the kitchen sink, right? <laughs> Everything plus the kitchen sink. So if possible, every three months in for that fluoride varnish, following up on those coaching things that you're implementing, pH, xylitol, fluoride, nano HA, um, an antimicrobial strategy if you can, silver diamine fluoride, super, super helpful in this case because you've got a lot of work to do. You need to, you need to slow down that process, right? And, and what can we coach with, with diet and, and home care? getting late I'm starting to throw things here and so this is where it was treated with um, silver diamine fluoride and then some some glass ionomer to get them because you know oftentimes those patients even though they haven't taken care for a long time right they care about right there and if you can take that and start to boost their confidence and they're so grateful for you for that you can slowly make some progress even though that one in the very back right is the one you want to start with <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's what's that what's that value to that patient what's going to make that most meaningful change in their life right <laughs> right so how would you approach this what you, what would you say I found these risk factors <laughs> which would you like to focus on first <laughs> and I, I'm trying to I think on this one this is one of those ones where they say exactly what you really don't want to do and you have to roll with it as a coaching because what was the what was the risk factor right he was drinking Mountain Dew and he says okay I'm gonna switch to drinking diet Mountain Dew is that gonna make a substantive change do we know that diet soda is equally full of crap yes is it still a positive right we've we've cut the sugar frequency a little bit it's still acidic it's a positive step. Great. How can I support you? It hurts a little, doesn't it? But you let them be in charge. You made that decision. They're taking that first step. It's something. It's tough. You might educate them if there's an opportunity and that diet soda still has it. But it's a positive change. It's one. You let them work on that one for a while. It makes you squirm a little, though. Risk mitigation. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Risk mitigation. <laughs> yes. Okay. Is this? Are you starting to see the pattern a little bit in this coaching, coaching language? So what I see, what I hear, I forget. What I see, I remember. And what I do, I understand. So I'm sorry for a virtual audience that we don't get to uh, <laughs> have you be as quite as hands-on. But we're going to do our best to make it fun. And um, interact if you're. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you want to get? Did you get a picture? Okay. Um, so um, we're going to demonstrate just a little bit of coaching here, and then we're going to have you guys do it. So um, if one of you wants to volunteer, or if Debbie wants to do it, we'll we'll do that because she's. <laughs> We'll see. Tell people just to do what I tell <laughs> do you want your yes. your so cheat sheet? So I remember your cheat sheet. Are. Yes. <laughs> okay. So we have a 45 year old male patient, veterinarian, ultra marathoner. I thought Debbie. Um, Debbie uh, demonstrates this super well. It just fits her to a T. Um, so we're going we're gonna to sort of do this. And it's best when you're coaching to try to get them at the same level, right? So many times when we're um, in the operatory, right, we've got them lean back. We're leaning over them upside down or this or that. Or we're leaning against the counter, standing up, looking down on them. So when we're having these coping conferences, if we can get eye level, be equal with them, we're going to be much more um, uh, effective. And kind of mirroring the patient, right? If the patient's sitting here like this, 
you know, kind of, or lean back, kind of get a little bit. You don't have to just be obvious and weird about it. Like if they stretch up and they're scratching their armpit, don't do it, you know. Um, but, you know, if they're across their legs, then a little bit later kind of cross your leg. I mean, just kind of get in the vibe of whatever, whatever they're, they're doing. Just helps it sort of feel a little bit more comfortable. And sometimes in the operatory, it's hard, right? If you can have some of these conversations in a consult room or in a other quiet room that you have in your office, that's always ideal. We don't have that kind of space in our office, so I'm oftentimes doing them in the operatory, and you do the, you do the best, the best that you, the best that you can. So, Debbie's going to play John Lennon. That really was his name, um, <laughs> uh, and so. She's sitting here. She's been referred by another dentist um, to me. And so, John, it's so nice to meet you here today. Why, what, what, how can I help you? Well, I try to be very healthy, but I've been giving some sedatives every year. I don't understand what I'm not supposed to. OK, so tell me a little bit about what, oh, yeah, we need to give you the mic. I'm sorry. Oh. Will it interfere the two too yeah. much? No, OK. All right. Am I on? Yeah, you're on. Okay. I'm just hold a little closer. Okay. So Debbie's just said she was referred to me by another dentist because she, or he, John, um, was was uh, getting cavities, five to six cavities every year, and the dentist didn't know, didn't know why, and they were frustrated because John is an ultra marathoner and usually eats pretty healthy. So I heard you're a runner. Tell I me a little bit about your running. So about five years ago, I started doing marathons. Um, I'm in excellent health. I don't take any prescription medications. I eat healthfully. Um, Tell me about your diet. I eat primarily fr fruits and vegetables and lean meat. I drink my coffee without sugar in the morning, and I drink water primarily the rest of the day. I avoid sweetened stuff. So it sounds like you um, eat pretty healthy. This, yes, this running is a pretty big deal to you, isn't yes, it? Yes. More or less, I stick to a Mediterranean diet. And I don't snack between meals. And I brush and floss. And you're a veterinarian, so you probably have pretty busy days, huh? Yes. Yeah. But I try to practice every night. Well, I practice running five days a week. So you run a lot of miles after work? Yeah, about or what, Tell me about your running. So um, I try to run 100 miles per week after work, rain or shine, but that's about the time I started developing new cavities every year. Well, you eat pretty healthy. You don't snack. You drink a lot of water. Yeah, it's tough to, tough to know what, um, what's going. You seem, you seem pretty healthy to me. I'm not even sure I can help you. Is there anything that we're missing here? Is there anything else you can think of that... Tell that that's in your daily life that, that we're not identifying here? Well, when I'm running, I do use some of those gels so that I have plenty of carbs loading for energy. So how are, tell me how you're utilizing those gels during your busy day. Mm -hmm. Well, the, I load up on some of them before... I go running so that I have plenty of carbs on board for energy. And then I I probably do four or five before I go running. Do you do them all at once or do you do um, them throughout the afternoon? No, I do it throughout the afternoon. Oh, so where do you keep these gels? In my desk. Oh, so every time you run through your office, you pick one up and you just do it so you get, a, so you get all the energy that you need. Yes. For your... Because I don't have much time in between treating my patients, so I just grab them. And so a lot of people aren't always familiar with these gels, right? This, we talked about it a little bit in that. In this case, the dental assistant had one in her purse and ran and got it. So we had this. So I look at it. You go, gee. That just looks like cake icing. So if you were eating cake icing all afternoon, every afternoon, what do you think would happen? Ah, uh, that's where my cavities are coming from. 
I think you're right. So do you think maybe you could take them all at once? You know, that might work. And I would recommend then that you just mm -hmm. rinse with your tap water and, and make sure we kind of rinse that out right. before you go running. Does that sound like something you could do? I think I could try that. Do you need any more support from me? I think we figured out the problem. I think we did too. Okay, so it actually turns out John died of a heart attack or a sudden heart failure a few years after this, but he was cavity free after that. Um, sometimes that simple conversation, right, rather than just the drilling and filling, um, makes that that difference. Um, so having that, uh, that open conversation based on that risk assessment, and that's tricky, right? Some of those are tricky. I had one that was eating chewable vitamin Cs. You know, those are, they're sometimes tricky things to figure out, so you have to keep asking that question. Is there anything else that we're missing here, right? Help me out, think about it. Sometimes that going home, sending them home with that food journal, right? Um, those things can, can do that. So helping them self-identify those those risk factors. So again, sort of what we demonstrated here, we want to sit eye to eye, we want to kind of mirror their behavior, try to ask as many open-ended conversations, be non-judgmental, report back the findings, you know, so, oh, so you're eating cake icing all afternoon, you know, they sort of, oh, they get it. Um, ask them what they want to do. Um, how do they solve that? How do they solve that um, problem? How can I help you? That's interesting. What I found, what would you like to what would you like to do? Okay, so we're gonna practice with a couple patients with where we interact with this, and so we're gonna let a couple other audience members play with this. And so those of you on the virtual um, can you pull up your patient cases because we're gonna hide the information from the other one. So you ready for this, Doc Fernandez? Sure, who you can pick you can pick whoever you want. You, well, you can pick. Well, you can pick your. Uh, you think, and I'm so going to be the patient. Yeah, one, we're going to trade, so we kind of get. You can be the patient once, and sure. you can be the doctor once. So. Okay. Okay. So, are you going to be the? Are you going to be the doctor? Sure, I'll be the patient. I'm a doctor all day long. I really don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'll give you the male patient. So. Okay. And so then you need your Carrie's risk assessment form and your pen. Oh, I'm going to fill it out. You're going to fill it out as the patient, and then who's going to be your doctor? Oh, uh, maybe Dr. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to put them in the hot seat up here. Uh, we call this love seat coaching. Okay. So can we read this first? Yeah, so those, are f so those of you who are online, um, Dr. Fernandez has picked up patient two. So this is Mason. So we're going to use the form patient two under what you had in your in your handouts um, and and the, he is going to fill out his the top portion of his carries risk assessment based on the patient demographics so those of you online that want to follow along with the the patient information can follow this and when when you guys trade and you're the patient you can be patient okay. Linda so that's yours if you want to and I have I have more visuals up here for you guys too. So. So I do have to have to actually fill out a carries risk. Yeah, yeah, because you're going to hand that to. Oh, okay, to Dr. Shear. To Dr. Oh, okay. Shear. So and I'll fill mine out according to. Uh huh. Time. Yep. So quick, quick bathroom break, water break for anybody online. We're we're at about two o'clock. We'll probably be um, another. Half an hour, 45 minutes, we'll get you out a little early today. I'm going to switch my slides over here to. Oh, is that in the way? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah. 
big deep billy of dry mouth every time I see her, not the character. Mason. Deep billy of dry mouth. I don't remember him as Cutthroat. I think he's, he's a fine guy. I don't remember. Oh, you feel like you have plenty of saliva. There you yeah, go. there you okay, go. So I was going to say, it should all be in there. Not a good thing, so. I read these ones less. Because <laughs> usually I'm just... So once again, those of you for online, we're just quickly um, doing patient Mason and patient Linda. That are the information is provided online for you in your handouts, and the patient's going to fill out the top half of the Carey's risk assessment form. This is part of the participatory area of our P4 dentistry that they're going to um, be doing, and. And we will shortly convene our patient and his doctor. <laughs> and my, my doctor's washing her hands. I think. <laughs> Your doctor's <laughs> washing her hands. <laughs> uh, okay, so is this for the patient? It, yeah, either way. Okay, You're just going to sort of sit eye to eye, knee to knee here, and. Um, and you guys are going to have to pass the mic back and forth a little bit. I know that's not quite ideal, but we're trying to do this, do this for our, for our, um, our audience here. Okay, so patient Mason has filled out his Carrie's risk assessment form, um, and he is going to hand it to his doctor and here is Mason's photos uh, I know it looks so good right <laughs> and here is Mason's radiographs Okay, and so Mason has handed his his Carrie's risk assessment form. Uh, his Carrie's risk assessment form to um, Dr. Shear. to Dr. Shear, and he is a 29-year-old man with an outgoing personality. You are slightly overweight. Otherwise, you feel like you are in good health and you feel good. You had knee surgery in 2012. And the only medication is levothyroxine. And so Dr. Shear is going to go through your caries risk assessment okay. with you and start to figure out what are the usual suspects? Who's causing this decay? Okay. Uh, Mason, as I look at your caries risk assessment, I see that you take medications daily but you don't experience any dry mouth? Not that I feel. No. Okay. Um, what are the liquids that you drink throughout the day aside from water? Well, you know, I was just about to go to high school. I used to play a little football in high school, and the uh, coach talked about electrolytes. I started drinking Gatorade, and I really like Gatorade a lot. In fact, um, I'll drink five to six bottles of Gatorade every single day. Talk to each other, not to me. I'm, I'm not here. Okay. <laughs> well, that is the risk factor that stands out to me. Would you like to discuss that further um, as to how it is impacting your oral health? Uh, sure, I guess. Is, is the Gatorade bad for me, Doc? Yes, the, every time you drink the Gatorade, you're losing mineral from your teeth, and the balance of mineral falling off is greater than the balance that you're putting back on, so you're at a high risk of getting dental decay and looking at your radiographs, and um, does it say how long since they're cleaning? Or? Okay. Okay. Um, 
what is your plan in coming in? What would you like to address? Uh, you tell me about it. <laughs> Actually, I do, and I'm getting married soon, so I'd like to have my front teeth look really good, so I want to make sure. I'm, we're getting married soon, so I want to make sure I get my teeth fixed up. That's why I'm here. Okay. I want to look good. Okay. Um, what support would you like from me? Well, just you let me know what I need to do so <laughs> I uh, so I don't have to, you know. <laughs> How many times a day do you brush? In the morning or at night or both? Uh, I, I, I'm pretty much, I'll brush, I brush in the morning most days. Okay, could we get you on track with getting a second brushing in? Uh, sure, why, why, sh why should I do that? Because when you brush with fluoride toothpaste, you put mineral back on your teeth. And right now, the balance of mineral that's falling off of your teeth is too great with the Gatorade consumption. So if we could narrow that down and do it less frequently, or you can do it with meal times, your breakfast, lunch, or dinner. But if you're doing it more than three times a day, there's too much of a pull in mineral falling off your teeth that leads toward your risk of getting new cavities, which aesthetically you don't want either. All right, that, that sounds good to me. I'd, I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> what I got to say right now is we're working with, with a system that her and I do this, we do Carrie's risk assessment and coaching on a style that we've actually developed that she's amazing at. And it's not this format, it's a different format. Yeah. We're, so we're, we're laughing, we're kind of morphing in, back, in and yeah, out of our yeah, own. No. Yeah. And so um, when we do our own kind of habitual script that we have, there it is open ended a lot. And so the conversation, there's, we're, you know, we're doing some of, the, you know, we're learning uh -huh. here um, uh -huh. on top of what, how we show uh -huh. it. We try to keep it down to a minimum because it's hard. You don't really have all day to talk to the patients. Nope. And we try to get an effect as quickly as possible uh -huh. and motivate them. And so, you know, she's, <laughs> we have this, so, yeah. So yeah. what types of open-ended questions were you asking based on your system? You guys have a system that you really yeah, like. So share with us a little bit. This is simply sort of right. what, what we've, put together to teach correct from our so we, 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 we really are and Kim's work Dr. Kush's work is all camera based so we use mm -hmm. the camera basis and so the visual like you said when the patient has a visual they'll they'll remember in our office uh, we don't we use a thing called the tug of war diagram which shows it shows sugar and biofilm it says plaque mm -hmm. and on the other side it shows your uh, saliva mm -hmm. and your, your fluoride exposure mm -hmm. and we tell patients you go through cycles of demineralization and remineralization mm -hmm. and how we explain it is it's like it's like it's like spending money and earning money so mm -hmm. if you can remineralize your teeth your teeth have the ability to repair themselves is what we teach them which a lot of people are like wait what and when we say the things you do during the day determine what's going to be the net effect. Uh -huh. So that once we do that, and she's really, her, we work on it together as a team, the patients fill in the gaps. They go, oh, I do this, I do this. So uh -huh. then you know you've got them uh -huh. understanding. So the message is really simple. We don't, we don't pH and all that stuff. It's a little right. bit too much to talk right. about to them. You just tell them minerals are going in, uh, in and out of your teeth. You want them to go in faster than they're going out. And here's what does it. So the medi we, we have we the medications and you could talk about oh we found this we say, we just say here here's your risk factors these are the things that we see on your on you, you they filled out the chart uh -huh. and we said you can't do anything about your genetics you're gonna take your high blood pressure medication here's the things you have control over you pick what you know here's what would you uh -huh. want to do and that's how we really uh -huh. do it so that you know to do so this so <laughs> what's your yeah. plan what do you what do you right. want to focus on what's your plan right yeah. and you're using right. the visual to sort of open up the concept of where this discussion is going and letting mm -hmm. them choose to fill in the pieces and, right, get, and gather right. that information. And Beautiful. so what she normally does, she'll talk about, sh you know, you can, you know, sh sugar exposures, the frequency, et cetera, mm -hmm. you know, the importance of brushing a second time during the day, remineralization. So we give them tips like, well, here's the other remineralization strategies that we recommend. Here's what we think, you know, they, they can do that or, or not. <laughs> And right. then here's what your risk factor is. One thing, things you can change, and she addresses that. And the, you know, plaque matters. You know, your mm -hmm. biofilm. If you got, that's one of the risk factors is mm -hmm. visible, visible biofilm. So she, right. we just go down the list and say, here's, like we found. She really say we found, found this. Right. This is what's happening, and right. we know this. And so, and you just keep pointing to the diagram of the minerals in and minerals out, and mm -hmm. it keep the patients. So they're nodding the whole time. They, mm -hmm. you're connecting. We we think it's effective. <laughs> yeah. No. And so. I think that's great. And I think it's. 
so valuable yeah. in this for our virtual audience as well as to just see taking the same concepts how do we sort of play it out um, you know there's so many of our consultants in dentistry that love to give us scripts right and I'm not trying to give you a script I'm trying to give you the concepts here today and the easy words to start incorporating into your bed we're so much more natural right if we can put it in our own words right. this mm -hmm. is what's worked for you two as a team who works together every day yeah. and it's beautiful but it's interesting to, to the virtual audience and some of the people that are watching this how as healthcare providers, sometimes asking those open-ended questions is so hard, right? Like even you guys who have practiced this so much, you're taking all this information, you're on the spot, and it's still so hard to ask those open, those open-ended, open-ended questions, and it sometimes almost feels awkward, right? Yeah. And, you know, uh, well, we feel like we're acting right now. I know, and I put you guys on the spot. Then, uh, then you know, uh, when we do this in the workshop, everybody's just doing it between each other. But again, it's sort of to start start practicing. Practicing the language, practicing that that thought yeah. process, and, it takes and a while. all like that. How long, how long do you think, Christina, it took us to kind of get to where we're at now, where we do this automatically? You know, it's like second nature. How long yeah, do you think? It's just second nature. I don't know. It helps a lot that you do it too, or that you know I've learned a lot from you, and so as I am so comfortable now doing it as I'm cleaning their teeth, I'm looking at their saliva flow, and if you know any of our patients. I can see when I update their health history if they're on medications that mm -hmm. can cause dry mouth, and I'll ask them at that time, and then when I'm in their mouth cleaning their teeth, I'm observing their saliva flow, and if it's dry or not, or I'll just say, oh, as I'm going around and cleaning, it does look like you have really good saliva flow, despite mm -hmm. you having a medication that can dry you out. Mm -hmm. So you have the risk factor, but it may not be effectively um, you know interfering with your saliva flow currently but mm -hmm. it could so just mm -hmm. know that or if we add a second one right or if right we, yeah you know so. yeah be sure and let us know so we can talk about how right. we can support that and so so in our office the usual suspects are in her mind and my mind in the front office so we we mm -hmm. have that the ph and the biofilm mm -hmm. for the patient we just want to let them know like hey this is going to help or this is what's maybe mm -hmm. the issue and um, and sometimes what we found is sometimes if a patient changes one factor, they'll go from being in balance to out of balance. Absolutely. And so if you can find that one thing that they did, and sometimes it's a couple of things because mm -hmm. it's a multifactorial disease. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to change a couple of things mm -hmm. or mul multiple. Yeah. Um, and, and that's sometimes just they don't choose that right. one most yeah. powerful one right no. at first, yeah. right? And but we're starting yeah. that process, and right? It's, yeah. And it's a process. But then one of the benefits we found is as we were doing this for a while, the patients started feeling the difference mm -hmm. where they their teeth used to bother them chronically. If they were cold, right. they're reaching for the Sensodyne and stuff. Right. And they're like, you know, after we've been coming to your office for a while now, I don't, I'm not afraid to have, have her clean my teeth. And right. It's a lot nicer right. now. Yeah. So they stop it's, saying it's, I hate the dentist quite they so They stop much, saying right? that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. but yeah. anyway. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay. So you guys are going to keep that and you're going to swap because we have our second patient case. And we have such great people doing this here. So, um, we go so we're here. now going to go to patient Linda. And um, Linda's going to fill out her Carrie's risk assessment form based on um, the information that she was provided. And I'm going to switch to patient Linda. A little aside, we feed the Carrie's screen meter at our office for all the swabbing kids. And one of the fun things we would do is we'd see like a, a, like a 17 or 16, 17 year old high school kid come in and we would look in their mouth and we would try to guess the carry screen score before it would come up, you know, just kind of like, what do you think? You know, put your bets in and you'd run it through the machine and like, oh, 6,000, who had 6,000? But it surprises yeah. you, right? Yeah. Um, um, so I think the long dry long. mouth patients are oftentimes will be low on the carry screen. Right, even though they've got the sticky plaque and and some of that, um, it it surprises you. Um, just like the patient that had beautiful oral hygiene and just had the one medication, and you, you all of a sudden get the carry screen, and you're like, whoa, yeah. that's that's really high. So again, it's not diagnostic, but it it is a super helpful tool. It's so easy. It's kind of a technology that impresses patients, um, and it just provides you a little bit more data to quantify and track that biofilm um, 
especially in those patients that already have great oral hygiene routines at home. Yeah. Okay, so Linda is a 67-year-old woman with an amiable personality. You have a fear of dentists. It has been about 10 years since you've been to the dentist. Um, you, know, you know, you keep that because he, can, he has to figure it out. Um, you liked your previous dentist, but he retired, and then you just didn't get motivated to go back until now. You have a couple teeth hurting you that brought you in. Health history includes allergy to penicillin and you have high blood pressure and cholesterol. Okay, so um, this is Linda's photos, and here is Linda's radiographs. Okay, well, Linda, welcome to our office. <laughs> um, first of all, is there anything, that, anything that's hurting you or bothering you? years and he retired and I just fell off track and never got back into the dental office and yes my upper left hurts and so does my lower uh, yeah a lot of my teeth hurt <laughs> okay well good I think there are some things that we might be able to help you with today so let's let's look at what might be uh, contributing to what's happening intraorally there's some things that we found here looking at your radiographs and looking at your health history here um, I see you're taking some medications and you notice that your mouth is dry. So the, the dryness, uh, it's the s your saliva it indicates that your lack of saliva, I should say, is very important to your dental care. And uh, I, saliva is very protective. It's part of what helps keep you healthy, your, your dentition. And so the, there is a lack of saliva, which is very we believe very important to what's happening inside your mouth, so we'll have to talk about that. And uh, let's see. Where's How come I don't have saliva? Okay, well, you're taking medications. The medications you take, if, if you open those little packet information that, that come with the medications, you'll see that there's dry mouth is listed as a side effect. Okay. And so th by taking, it's very common, it's the number one reason why people have dry mouth is okay. medications they take. So the, and the, I tell, I tell, in our office, we always tell patients, the your real dentist is your saliva. We're just the, uh, we're just the repair people. So because your, your real dentist is compromised, your saliva is not there to help remineralize re your teeth. Um, there's a, there's an outflow net. You're losing minerals around your teeth, and that's what's causing the discomfort and the, and the, the loss of tooth structure. Um, let's see, do you drink liquid? And then I see you're snacking. Could you tell me, like, what's your pattern of eating? Like, wh how would you describe your, you know, typical day, how you consume foods? Mm, I, I eat regular meals, but in between meals, because my mouth is dry, I suck on Jolly Ranchers because they're a nice, hard, big piece of candy that'll last a long time, so... <laughs> I don't have to have too many of them on me to make it last all day. <laughs> okay, so I can see how having a dry mouth, you'd be motivated to do something to stimulate that saliva to try to get it going. Um, we're going to recommend some alternatives that can stimulate saliva flow, but yet the, the Jolly Ranchers have a sugar in them which will feed your, your plaque bacteria that are generating acids, and that's, that's, the, that's contributing to the cycle of breakdown you're suffering. So we're going to... We're going to try to address the, the role of remineralization, demineralization, and, and maybe make some suggestions that you can find easy to follow and, and hopefully put a, put a stop to what's happening here. Um, okay, so, um, and then again, I'm going to start falling back into our old patterns of remineralization, how we do it again. So, but um, for purposes of this discussion, you know, we're trying out some new roles here, so. But so, uh, yeah, so, you, so which you've talked about your risk factors of saliva and diet. Was there some biofilm risk factors that you identified? Uh, for her, we don't, there one am. Don't, don't notice any yeah. plaque, okay. Okay. But her carry, scre her carry screen score was 7694. 7,000? 7,694. Okay, yeah. So your, your carry screen indicates that the biofilm, the little, we all have a layer of bacteria that live in our mouth, and this this little squab we took shows that your your biofilm is very 
acidogenic. It's it's good at generating acids, and that acid is the is a lowering a pH that's actually causing the the calcium and phosphate of your dentition to to leave your teeth, and that's that's where it's going. <laughs> that's where the, you're losing all that min that mineral there. Um, so the biofilm is essential to. Uh, to part of the situation. We want to be able to kind of turn things around and get you in a state where things are stable and, and you're not having to suffer through this. If we simply just go ahead and repair the, the damage that you have, it'll come back again if we don't address these issues. You'll be, I, I, yeah. I came into an inheritance and I want my teeth all done. I want my smile to get beautiful again. Mm -hmm. And so how do I make my mouth not as big all the time? Okay, so that's that's important. That's a great question, by the way. So what we'll do, we'll, we'll show you some tips on less frequent sugar ingestion. We'll give you some substitutes that you can do to suck on that'll increase your your your, sh your saliva flow, but not contribute by the sugar generating more acids because the acids are what's or really what's damaging your teeth here. So we want to get you nice and stable first. We wouldn't want to go ahead and just simply replace everything without addressing the disease first. Otherwise. What we put in your mouth will will break down again, and so we don't want to wind up where you're at right now again. So, kind of talk about a plan. Can can you work together, coaching to? Okay. Yeah. Well, basically, so and and well, we our plan I would recommend first of all is just to. And is, are you a once a day brusher or twice a day your character? So, so in her medical history, she had a stroke, so she really struggles with her oral hygiene because oh, her okay. hand doesn't work well. Oh, okay, yeah. So, um, uh, you know, it, for what we will do is if a patient is compromised, physically compromised, we try to come up with other strategies. I mean, we'll automatically we put them on 5,000 ppm toothpaste. If it's a biofilm issue, we we do have, we have treatments at the office. We'll do some chlorhexidine for some patients. It depends on how, if it's hard for her to mix the part A and B. Treatment rinse is a two-part, mm -hmm. and you have to ask about their living situation too. Is there somebody there for you? Are you there on your own? Mm -hmm. And kind of get an idea of what they're capable of doing on their own. And so uh, we varnish, we mm -hmm. use SDF, we do, we're doing, you know, pretty much Right. what we talked about today. So in this case you would have his you would have access typically to her medical history. Correct, right? You yeah. would know those medications, you would know that she probably reported that she had a stroke. So you might right. ask her, how is this affecting? Tell me how this is affecting your ability to to do your daily oral right. hygiene routines at home, right? And start to start Absolutely. to have her identify what she's yeah. doing and and sympathize, you know, say, oh that sounds like it must be really difficult to do this. Right. right? Did your and character just have a stroke recently too or Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we take, you know, you, we go through the, our, ch our checklist mm -hmm. and we go down the boxes, each one of them. And so if they have something going, we'll talk about, well, here's here's a risk factor. We always address them as risk factors and protective factors. Yeah. So. I love that. Correct. Yeah. If they have a hygiene issue and, mm -hmm. you know, we start with frequency mm -hmm. and. Yeah. So mechanical hygiene plays a role. Mm -hmm. And then we teach them remineralization strategy, like Christine is constantly saying. After you brush your teeth, spit it out. Don't rinse it off. And a lot of people are like, "Wow, you know, th that's new to them." Right. Put them on five thousand ppm toothpaste. The whole thing. Talk about. Just yeah, fifteen minutes of brushing. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. So. Don't you love that when they tell you that they're going to oil pull for 20 minutes? <laughs> yeah, that's like, yeah. When was the last time you brushed for two? Yeah. How's that yeah. going to work out for you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can do that, do, do that sometime in the afternoon if you like to oil pull. Yeah, <laughs> just right. Just promise me a little toothpaste in the morning and before bedtime. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, those are funny. So, so yeah, we, we have all three risk factors essentially right here with this patient. And so, you, you know, to, to say, I've identified these risk factors or we've identified these risk factors, however you visually like to present it, right? Mm -hmm. I think you and your offices and your teams, you have to decide what's, what's comfortable language, what's comfortable language. You know, we're trying to give you a repeatable example here, but, mm -hmm. you know, get together with your teams, practice these, you have access to these. Because as you know, when you sit down to try to do it at first, right, it's not always automatic. It took you guys a while to figure out right. your protocols for what you're doing in your office. Yeah. I, I have these great, great people to <laughs> add what? to my lecture. It has been fun. I mean, after that, look, I've been a dentist for over 30 years. In the last 10 years that we've been doing hardcore carries risk assessments, been the most fun. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, it's it, it is, yeah. Yeah. Right. Every time you take a bite and that oil has not grown, it's, yeah. it's 
We, right. When we see active carries, we wig out. I mean, we had a patient come in that was like, whoa, we're looking at the bio wings. And so for us, active tooth decay is like, oh, it's like, it's a, it's startling yeah. to us. It's that we're at that level of, of prevention. So uh, it's fun. <laughs> Unlike some other places where it's like when you get a patient without active caries, you're like, oh, yeah. my God. Right? No, no, <laughs> yeah, no, we have real fun at what we do. So, yeah, this stuff actually works. <laughs> Go ahead and try it. <laughs> so what, going back to you guys' experience, um, what would you say was the kind of the most challenging part to implement or to start to work on? Because, you know, we've tried to formalize some of this coaching stuff a little bit. Yeah and give you a protocol and some questions to work on. And I'm sorry that I don't have some of that in a handout to give. I'm right. working on that. Um, uh, but as a clinician, I mean, I'm going back to the early 2000s, like, like 2010 or so when I was kind of getting to see what camera was about. It was to organize it in my head what what mattered, and then how, how do I take this into my office? We only have... You got if you got an hour for a profi, that means you know she's got to do her work, and we're, we're trying to take care of Perry, all kinds of screening. And how do you get this? across and it was a, as a process of distillation for that so you want to affect the coaching aspect but we don't get paid to sit down and have these conversations with our patients mm -hmm. so what I had to do is how do I make Canberra so it's not something one more thing that we do it's what we do so it starts with our health history we have all these little boxes and we fill it out so we can kind of look at everything and go oh they're gonna be hyposalivary we know right away what medications mm -hmm. they are so then I have a carries risk assessment that we give in our office. I walk in the room, she's got half the boxes checked off. I look for disease indicators, and it's just, it's in the, it's always running in the back of our mind. And the so, so you're not having the patient fill out your carries risk assessment? They do. In, they in, our, in their okay. dental, and they start as new patients. We, we took the UCSF straight up questions. You mm -hmm. know, do you, it's basically these questions. Is mm -hmm. your mouth dry? Mm -hmm. How often do you brush? What's mm -hmm. your dietary? Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, there's, you know uh, recreational drug use was one of the things. Mm -hmm. So we, they check the boxes, mm -hmm. and when they come in, we already have a, a kind of a pre-score with them and then we add the layer of what do the radiographs look like how mm -hmm. what's their saliva flow like so when we're done it's like oh this is it's a no brain this is a high risk patient this is a moderate risk patient are they mm -hmm. an ortho ortho is almost mm -hmm. automatically moderate risk to begin with so mm -hmm. we have that and we kind of fine tune it a little bit now what the discussion for what the patient's going to wind up doing depends on what you're talking about did she just have a stroke is she living alone are they right. young and capable? Are they pounding the orange juice or the Gatorade? There's just, right. you know, just sh you have the conversation back and forth. And if, it, if you're effective, the patient comes up with their own solutions. They're just saying, mm -hmm. here's all these, here's like a, you put out a little buffet for them mm -hmm. and they make the selection for what mm -hmm. they want to do to get to where they need to go. And we just said, mm -hmm. it's just minerals in, minerals out. You, you, you control this, not us. We're only, we only see you for an hour every few months. Mm -hmm. We have data in every profi. Every mm -hmm. profi, yeah. yeah. Okay. We just ask so you're typically doing it every six months. Yeah, we do it all the time. Yeah, yeah. you're doing it. Yeah, every it's six baked months. in. It's baked yeah. into our system. It's what yeah. we do at our office. And once you do it that way, then it's easy. It's not mm -hmm. something. It's not one more thing you do. It's what we do. Yeah. And that was a process. It takes a while to figure out how to do that. And that's and what I, mean, I think. Your staff I wanna, matters. Your staff. You have to have good staff. Yeah. I, that's what I want to kind of stress to our virtual audience is one, all of you hygienists, you're the key, right? You are the key. You can really make this program shine. You know, it's not about, oh, my God, I'm not sure if my doctor believes this. Start doing this, and it will it will come, right? Yeah. Um, as you develop it and it becomes more natural, you may want to have your own caries risk assessment, or you want to incorporate things like you were talking about with your medical history or something like that. Uh, what I love about this one is it's so simple with its color-coded things, right? You can take some of these concepts that we've talked about today and really put them in just it's so mm -hmm. simple right and as you become more comfortable with it you may want to do it in a way that but does this but this is a really great super simple mm -hmm. yeah you need a starting point. point you need something that works mm -hmm. for you and your staff and, and your patients so right just come up with a system whatever it is as long as it's easy to do it it works right and it, we were talking about this a little bit here in person at lunch um, about some siblings that we've just recently treated in our office and um, both Carigenic, you know, high, higher risk, moderate to high risk, you know, and and kind of talking about those coaching questions. And so the 18-year-old sister, oh, man, we started diving. She never had a filling in her life. We started diving. She was super motivated, right? Like, I do not want to have a filling. Younger brother was getting ready to start ortho, talking to him about this. And, you know, well, you might be able to remineralize some of these. And it's like, Psh, I'm not going to do that. So we put fillings in, right? So we treated the two siblings completely different. Similar carries risk assessments mm -hmm. because we let them choose, right? We let them have that opinion in the matter. And um, yeah. 
and do that. And so I think that that was a really fun example we were talking about over lunch. Yeah, and it's important not to be judgmental. You know, in life I, I can be very judgmental, but in the office when I'm a clinician, I just have to listen and just mm -hmm. like you say, here's what we see, here's what we what we know. This is what the evidence shows us to be, and here's what we see in your mouth. And you know, you try to get the patient to kind of get engaged with it's in the process. Right? These are my teeth. Those are your yeah. teeth. You can do with them however you want, right? We don't need to put our right and wrong opinions on that and and and, I, and again it's like I'm trying to give some tools here to um, to to start you on this road of having that and and just as we talk about right it's hard to sometimes ask those open we are always constantly catching ourselves I'm sure you guys do in your practice I know I still do is it's like oh I could have asked that better I could have asked that a little bit better cause, but but it's that just continuing to strive to find those those ways to do it because every conversation with every patient is completely completely yeah different right it's and weird you and me doing those conversations right? it's <laughs> like oh we're gonna <laughs> and, and yet we do it we do it you know and we could do it in our sleep at work <laughs> right but in doing this role playing here share with our virtual audience sort of what you felt when you were the patient and how how that was interacting do you sort of see from the patient perspective how that the difference in the feel of how the question is asked yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of psychology in dentistry, as anybody who's practicing knows. I mean, because which we never so took unique. any classes in. Yeah, <laughs> well, we, we took a little bit, but uh, but yeah, just you're trying to figure out what clicks with each person is a real. That's part of the challenge of being a good clinician is how you're going to connect with that person mm -hmm. um, on a way where it's all. It, it really, at the end of the day, this is about trust. I believe mm -hmm. uh, when you understand how to help the patient help themselves. Um, and they'll they become they'll trust what you're doing as a clinician, and that trust you you can't buy that. You got to earn that. And mm -hmm. so once your patients trust you, it's the goodwill and the f that's when it gets fun. You know, mm -hmm. you have a good time with your patients and your staff. Yeah. And it comes back to you. Yeah. And 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 I think you can say as working as a team, right? You sort of start to learn to have these handoffs in these coaching conversations. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah. Front off. And I, I know that sometimes I'll walk into the hygiene room and the hygienist will say. Oh, we were just talking, and we just discovered she was just sharing with me, and it just picks up this conversation, and 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 it reinforces each other. And what it sees in our office, I'm the only clinician, so it's, you know, it's her, me, and my, our front office person, who's a very ex experienced uh, dental assistant. And so when everybody's as a team, we just, you know, we're literally passing them off as best we can to get into the right, the treatment plan, the products. Mm -hmm. Saying the mm -hmm. same thing, the message is uniform mm -hmm. throughout the office. She's what what I'm saying matches what Christina's saying, mm -hmm. and we're not bumping into each other or contradicting each other. Everybody's on the same page, and mm -hmm. it makes it easy and fun. Yeah, and I think that is fun, and I think it's a very freeing experience, right? You you stop owning so much of it in terms of beating yourself up and just realizing that it's again, it's letting that feather go wherever it's going to go, right? You're just trying to support and empower it, and. Um, and for those of you who haven't integrated some of this in your office or just starting or some of, the, some of these conversations are going to be awkward. Just when I pop you in and make you be the, you know, it feels awkward so to figure awkward. out these <laughs> questions, right? Um, and disrupting whatever sort of other habits we have or those mm -hmm. problem solving habits that we have or just telling our patient, well, this is now you need to do it yeah. instead of starting to let them make those decisions of where they're going to go by, by empowering and educating them. And so I think, um, it's a process and don't feel like oh my gosh I just completely screwed it up on Monday I'm gonna throw this out right I mean gosh we've been working on this in my office for what 12 years at least that we really have been doing, and we still laugh about how oh I completely forgot to do that or I botched that question up and didn't get anywhere where I wanted to go but we develop relationships over time, right? And 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 so many of these changes in those relationships happen over time. And, and it does take time, you know. We, we're, you know, Sonoma County is kind of a there's air, it's a no fluoride conversation for a lot of patients. Yeah. But we found over time some of our no fluoride patients are using over the counter fluoride toothpaste. You know, if you yeah. you, you got to speak to them on their language, they're, they're mm -hmm. they want to be healthy. Mm -hmm. And I say I want that for you too. And you just you got to speak your own what you mm -hmm. believe to be the truth of something something is, and let them kind of come to that decision. Now, some people you don't have to beat them up about the floor because their diet's so good. So don't don't try to have somebody do something that they don't really need. So we don't yeah. we let it go. Or that they don't want to do. Oh, they don't want to do it. They get that. They, it's their mouth. They you know you don't own it. You just get teeth. to you just you're just there offering your 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 take on things. That's basically all you get to do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
No, it's a, it's, 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 it's a super fun thing as you practice it. And, and, and feel free to take what you've learned today and put it in your own words, right? There's many ways to do this. There's many great questions that we can ask um, along the way. So thank you guys for being my, my demonstrators here for all, for all of this. And uh, yeah, there we go. And um, so we're just going to go to a little bit of finish up wrap up here of some some great take home terms that you can have um, if any of you guys are interested in having this in a handout it is one of these things that I'm going to try to work on um, to to make and so um, feel free to email me or I can send it to the dental society here and make that available for you um, but how can I help you a great opening start to find out what they're interested in what their values are what they care about um, my favorite go-to that's interesting tell me more about that it just unpacks so many, so many things. Um, what I found, rather than saying you have, what I found was these RAS factors or these conditions. Um, what would you like to do? You know, putting it right in their court and then rolling with it when they go there, even if it's sort of one of those things that makes you a little uncomfortable or squirmy. Tell me your plan. Uh, the 18-year-old that I was working with this week be before I came down here, you know, we talked about all these things, and then we were doing some other things in the clinic, making some, some scans and impressions and doing some things. And then as she was leaving, I said, tell me what your plan is. And I brought it back, and I made it repeat it to, to me again. And, and she was right on point with it. And just having them verbalize that really makes that difference in sort of cementing it and, and making them a little bit more um, accountable. So again, I want to thank Carrie Free for helping to sponsor this for your dental society. You can get free webinars for your office, free books um, here. And somewhere in the future, my one little plug here is because if I say this, I will be accountable, is that I am working on a book um, with the working title, Eat, Laugh, and Connect. And it's for those, those people working towards retirement and all those changes in life end-of-life things and looking at those values of what's most important, right? The two, two, cru two last great joys in life is eating, um, eating and laughing and, and being with our family. And so I'm trying to take all what I see in dentistry and help people make really positive end-of-life retirement decisions based on their values just by using the examples that I see in dentistry. So I try to take another take to help people with their health care. So this is, a, this is a work in progress. I want to thank everybody who is here online with us, the Red Dental Society, for inviting me, my great, my great live audience here. And um, please email me. I will respond to every email. If any of you are interested in coaching, whether it's in your dental office, life coaching, doing other things, doing it as a side gig to your dentistry, or anything I can help with Carrie's risk management, please feel free um, to reach out to me. And so thank you so much for having me to Sonoma County. Thank you to our online audience. Uh, just to let everyone know that uh, you guys should be receiving your CEs by end of business on Monday. If everyone could please remember to comment, that way we can make sure we have an accurate head count. And like, comment, and subscribe. That way we can grow our YouTube channel and make sure we can bring more online stuff to the dental community. Thank you. <laughs>